afternoon, everybody. This is the Wednesday, May 17th, 2023 afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Good afternoon, Keelan. Please call the roll. Good afternoon. Ryan. Hi. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. We'll now hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. We have one item this afternoon, but it's a thick one. Please call item number 394 a report. Approval of the FY 2023-24 budget for the City of Portland. Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome. To take, we take a series of steps and votes as part of the approval of the fiscal year 2023-24 budget as prescribed by Oregon state law. As the City of Portland's budget committee, we will hold a hearing on the uses of state revenue sharing, consider changes to the approved budget as filed, and approve the tax levies for the fiscal year 23 2024. I'm now convening this meeting of the City of Portland Budget Committee. Keelan, please call the roll on the Budget Committee. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. Before we begin, I want to briefly take a moment to acknowledge the work that's led us today. Throughout the spring, we held six budget work sessions, each led by the Commissioner in charge of a designated service area. Those work sessions helped us better understand how the Bureau resources are currently allocated, learn about financial plans, and key performance metrics. Council also held three public listening sessions to gather information and input from the general public about what issues they'd like to see prioritized within the budget. My staff and I and my colleagues' staffs met with uh, us and with other commissioners to strategize on the best ways to use the resources we have available. I want to take a moment to recognize the city budget office and ushering us throughout what has been a very complicated process. A considerable amount of work each and every one of these commissioners and their teams have put into this budget. Together, we've produced a budget that builds on the priorities that we've heard from Portlanders. Those include homelessness, public safety, economic recovery, and livability issues like cleaning up the graffiti and the trash. I am not going to go through the entirety of my budget message again because almost everybody in this room has already heard it twice, but it is available uh, online if people would like to review that. So I'm going to skip to this. All of this work requires significant staff time and investment. We know that over the last budget, several budget cycles, this council and prior councils have created a solid foundation to facilitate the incredible amount of work that we are proposing. Today you are meeting again as a city budget committee to move the city's budget forward to the final adoption adopted budget. There are five attachments that you've already received that we'll be discussing as we go through these proceedings. I'd like to go through those very quickly for the public. Attachment A, a step-by-step -step description of the process for consideration of the deliberations on changes to the FY 23-24 proposed budget. Attachment B is a list of all adjustments by organization to the FY 23-24 proposed budget 
amendments to change resources as approved by council today will be updated into this attachment. Attachment C is a summary similar to attachment B, to B, B, which is uh, adjustments by fund and major object category. And we will again update that depending on what decisions you make today. Attachment D has the budget notes as proposed for the approved budget. This document will be amended to include any new notes approved during this hearing today. And attachment E is the tax increment collections planned for the city's urban renewal districts. The following are the steps for our approved budget hearing as outlined in attachment A of the filing documents. First, we will conduct a hearing to discuss state revenue sharing. This is a legally required step to receive revenues from the state of Oregon into the city's general fund. Second, the budget committee will be, have an opportunity to introduce amendments to the mayor's proposed budget as filed with the city clerk. Following the introduction of amendments, the public will have an opportunity for testimony on the proposed budget and amendments as offered. Third, there is dedicated time to discuss amendments and then a vote occurs for each amendment. Fourth, after the votes on each amendment, there will be a subsequent series of votes. The first will be to update the relevant attachments, attachments B, C, and D, based on the passage of amendments. Second, council will vote to approve the total budget as amended. And yes, we know it's going to be a lot of voting and the city attorney's office is on hand to be sure that we get the steps correct. Fifth and finally, for today, the last action will be to vote the approved budget, excuse me, the approved tax levies, including urban renewal levies. These are the steps we'll take this afternoon. Christy and I and the staff will be working closely with you to try to respond to any questions as we move on. With that, Mr. Mayor, I'll return it back to you. All right, very good. So as you had proposed, first up is the state revenue sharing. I'm now opening a hearing to discuss possible uses of state revenue sharing. This hearing is being held by the City Council of Portland, Oregon in compliance with the provisions of state revenue sharing regulations, specifically ORS 221.770. It's to allow citizens to comment on the possible use of these funds in conjunction with the annual budget process. As proposed for council adoption, the fiscal year 23-24 budget anticipates receipts totaling $24,322,559, almost got through that, $24,322,559 from state revenue sharing. As has been the case in prior years, it's proposed that this revenue be allocated in equal parts to support fire prevention and police patrol services. Keelan, is there anyone here today who has signed up to testify on this particular matter? I don't believe so. Is there anybody here who wants to? Very good. I'm now closing this hearing to discuss possible uses of state revenue sharing. Colleagues, I'm seeking a motion on the technical change to attachment B. First, Director Gru, why don't you describe the change in attachment B as filed? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There is only one adjustment from the proposed budget to the approved that was incorporated into the council filing documents. This is a very technical change made at the recommendation of the OMF accounting by the city's controller shortly after the proposed budget was published. The request of the controller is that use is to use a direct budgeting method in the Portland Clean Energy Fund instead of a fund transferred method to send $12,728,487 of resources to the Housing Investment Fund for energy efficient and renewable energy improvements in affordable housing development. There is no change in the resource level for the Portland Clean Energy Fund 
there is a reduction of the 12 million to no longer recognize a fund transfer between Portland Clean Energy Fund and the House Investment. Again, there is no program act change to the delivery of services. The fund managers were consulted with OMF accounting and in order to meet the requests of accounting, the change in form of budgeting was made. That's the summary. Thank you, and yeah. before I ask for a motion, does anybody have any questions of Director Grew on this item? Very good, I'll entertain a motion on, a, on the technical change to attachment B. So moved. Commissioner Rubio moves. Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. All right, now we'll hear and second other amendments as well. For those which are co-sponsored, please note that in your motion for the record. Before I make my amendments, first I'd like to share a little bit of broader context about the amendments I'm putting forth today. Colleagues, as you know, Portlanders are overburdened by increased government taxes, utility rates, and fees. After the massive surge in Oregon's population over the decade from 2010 to 2020, with growth of over 10%, PSU Population Research Center indicated a loss of over 12,000 Portland residents in recent years. As we learn from various experts, affordability is the key reason. We must work together to ensure that we protect Portland's small businesses and workers and safeguard our economic future by demonstrating fiscal discipline where we can. Many of the amendments will reduce rate and fee increases on SDCs, street parking, utility rates, and in other areas. We've also included budget notes to evaluate future administrative fee increases and grants. And the reason that we are proposing budget notes rather than going through them individually is because there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of them, and we need to be thoughtful about how we do that. I'll begin with my amendments. First up is Wheeler Amendment 1. This is a budget note, update policy on five-year financial planning timelines and submissions. <coughs> and if you'll bear with me, colleagues, I will read the specific amendment into the record. To ensure a transparent and timely process, the City Budget Office, CBO, will review existing financial policies and create a new schedule and decision-making process for all Bureau multi-year financial plans as part of the annual budget process and to be presented to Council earlier in the process. In addition, CBO will review the existing policy for the establishment of reserve funds to address emergencies address temporary fluctuations in revenues and expenditures, and provide stability during economic cycles. The policy shall revise guidelines for the content of the financial plans, including alternative forecast scenarios, assumptions used in preparing the plan, schedules for the timing and amount of the plan debt issuance, rate increases for all service fees, and the methodology for the development, use, and replenishing of financial reserves. The policy will also include the timing of work sessions and the approval of the financial plans by the mayor and council. CBO will also include in the budget schedule options for council approval of rates earlier in the budget process. A work group will be convened to allow for input from bureaus on the policy prior to submission to the council. And of course, update attachment D as appropriate. I move, can I get a second please for Wheeler 1? Second. Commissioner Mapp seconds. Wheeler 2, budget note, development of policy and process for timing of revenue bonds for utilities. The, con the, the exact wording is this. The City Budget Office, in conjunction with the Office of Management and Finance Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services, will review and revise city financial policy for debt management to include timelines and notifications of future revenue bond sales with rate assumptions to Council in conjunction with the annual rate ordinance for utility rates. This review of policy and process should include the timeline for adoption for utility rates prior to the release of the Mayor's proposed budget. Set expectations for appropriate levels from Council offices for timing of bond sales and the City's budget process in the inclusion of information on requested rate increases during the authorization of bond issuance, and the policies will ensure transparency in the rate development process for council offices and the public. 
and again, update attachment D is appropriate. I move, can I please get a second for Wheeler 2? Second. Second, second from Commissioner Ryan. Wheeler 3, budget note, inventory and review of bureau-specific fees. And I hinted at this one a moment ago. Here's the, the language. As part of the review of city financial policies, the city policy for revenue recovery, FIN 2.03, shall also be reviewed in the fiscal year 23-24. Bureaus that set fees administratively through the city's annual budget process shall also provide city council with information on the purpose, cost methodology, date of last revision, and frequency of activities supported by these fees in their fiscal year 2023-2024 budgets. Bureaus shall submit the inventory of administratively set fee information to the City Budget Office by August 30th, 2023. And then update attachment D is appropriate. I move, can I get a second? Second. second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Wheeler four, reduce rate growth for the Water Bureau water retail rates to the fiscal year 2022-23 forecast of 7.7% growth. Language, the Portland Water Bill will reduce its retail growth rate to the prior forecasted growth rate in the fiscal year 2023-2024 to 7.7% from 8.9%. To enact this reduction in the rate growth, the revenues for the water sales in the water fund will be reduced by $2,400,000. To balance, the water fund contingency expenses will also be reduced by $2,400,000 on a one-time basis. The Water Bureau will take cost containment efforts in advance of the fall bump, which may include holding positions vacant or delaying projects that have not started. Further, the affordability programs will not be reduced to achieve this reduction. The full impact of holding the growth rate consistent will be incorporated in the fiscal year 2024-2025 rate budget. Update attachments B, C, and D is appropriate. I move, can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Wheeler five, reduce rate growth for the Bureau of Environmental Services sewer rates for the fiscal year 2022-23 forecast of 3.15%. Language. The Bureau of Environmental Services will reduce its retail growth rate to the prior forecasted growth rate in fiscal year 2023-24 to 3.15 from 5.15%. To enact this reduction in forecast rate growth, the revenues for sewer system in the sewer operating fund will be reduced by $8 million. To balance, contingency expenses will also be reduced by $8 million on a one-time basis in the sewer operating fund. The Bureau of Environmental Services will take cost containment efforts in advance of the fall bump, which may include holding positions vacant or delaying projects that have not started. Further, the affordability programs will not be reduced to achieve this reduction. The full impact of holding the growth rate consistent will be incorporated in the fiscal year 2024-25 rate budget Update attachments B, C, and D is appropriate. I move, can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Wheeler six, reduce on-street metered parking by 40 cents per hour in the Portland Bureau of Transportation, fiscal year 2023-2024 budget, transportation operating fund. The Portland Bureau of Language, the Portland Bureau of Transportation General Transportation Revenue Forecast and the fiscal year 2023-24 proposed budget assumes a metered parking rate increase of 40 cents per hour, which was approved by council in February of 2022. That was resolution 37564. The last metered parking rate increase occurred in 2016. This amendment removes the incremental increase of 40 cents per hour in metered parking rate revenue as a resource to support program expenses. To enact this reduction, the parking fee revenues in the Transportation Operating Fund will be reduced by $8,300,000. To balance, contingency in the Transportation Operating Fund will be reduced by $8,300,000 in the fiscal year 2023-2024 year, adding to ongoing program reductions, including reducing positions for fiscal year 2024-25. Update attachments B, C, and D as appropriate. I move, can I get a second? There's no second, uh, uh, the amendment 
I'll second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. That concludes my amendments, colleagues. Now I'll pass it on to my colleagues to present any additional amendments. Uh, I'll just call in the order that I have here, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Okay, colleagues, as you know, um, and as you're likely you have read today, um, laser focus on increasing housing production and improving permitting services, and more specifically, uh, the intersection of those two priorities. And we can't solve this problem alone. Interest rates are the biggest barrier to housing production, uh, but we don't control that. So I'm looking at the levers that we can pull, and that's why I offer the following amendment to freeze um, system development charges at the fiscal year 22-23 level for the next fiscal year. My amendment reads, fiscal year 22-23, I'm sorry, fiscal year 23-24 system development charges, SDCs, will remain at fiscal year 22-23 rates. The system development charges, SDCs for Parks, Bureau of Environmental Services, Water, and Portland Bureau of Transportation are to remain at the fiscal year 22-23 rates for 23-24. This represents a one-year freeze of SDCs. The SDC revenues to collect in the Parks Capital Fund, Fund 402001, will be reduced by $1.4 million, and Parks Capital Fund contingency will also be reduced by $1.4 million. The STC revenues to connect, collect in the water fund will be reduced by one million and the water fund contingency will also be reduced by one million. The STC revenues to collect in the transportation operating fund will be reduced by 400,000 and transportation, transportation operating fund contingency will also be reduced by 400,000. The SDC revenues to collect in the sewer system operating fund will be reduced by one million and sewer system operating fund contingency also reduced by one million. Update exhibits B and C as appropriate. But before the, um, the mayor asks for a second, I want to share with our bureaus and the public that this wasn't a light decision uh, that, that was made. Those numbers I read off are meaningful numbers and our bureaus will have to navigate what they mean for various capital investments. But I do think that freezing the rate for just one fiscal year, we will have balanced our immediate needs to do all that we can to increase, increase housing production with our long-term infrastructure needs. And this is a unique time in history and we need more home, homes for Portlanders. And those homes and decreasing the amount of time it takes for those homes to be approved are what's driving this for me. And on that note, I just want to be transparent about where we're heading, where I'm heading next, and the additional support I'm going to ask of my colleagues. My office has been looking at the intersection of housing production and our permitting services for about five months. And to put it bluntly, and but with respect for the years and years of work that predate me, um, we are ready to move on from tiptoeing around these systemic problems and ready to pull off the Band-Aid. And Mayor, you and I first spoke about consolidation back in January, and I asked you for time to do my own analysis, and the permitting task force's great diligence has even preceded this. I've done the work, and I'm now calling on BDS with the oversight from a project manager to put together a plan to create one permitting bureau for the city of Portland. And the choice is ours and our bureaus is this. We, we need to start now to shape proactively because it will happen to us um, when our first city administrator is hired and no city administrator will look at our current system and thinks that this permitting system makes sense. So therefore, it's my strong position that this work begin as soon as possible with an eye toward fiscal year 24-25 budget process. In other words, we need to have the chairs on the deck sorted out between now and the end of this calendar year so that there is a consolidated budget for a permitting bureau submitted come January 2024. And the single bureau will be realized come July 21, 2024. And that gives our bureaus and our budget office a solid year of runway. Um, I need to do some work with BDS and with my named partner, Commissioner Ryan, to get this off the ground, but we will release more information in the weeks to come. Thank you for the space for me to be transparent in what I think is the right move for our city. So I would appreciate support from my colleagues. Commissioner Second. Rubio moves. Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Commissioner, you have another? Thank you. Um, this is my, my second and last mayor. Uh, colleagues, our economic recovery and all the work that we are doing to help our beloved city, as well as the increased cost government needs to provide the level of service our community members expect, has highlighted for me the need for centralizing forecasting. It is in the best interest of the city council and the city government 
that all of our bureaus are reporting to and complying with various assumptions in their forecasting for revenues. This is also an action that better prepares us for our first city administrator. So my budget note reads, budget note, centralized coordination of forecast fiscal year 24-25 budget development. The city budget office and the city economist will convene a work group to coordinate underlying assumptions for forecasting revenues in advance of the development of the fiscal year 24-25 budget. The timeline will be developed and shared with bureaus as the schedule for the 24-25 budget development process is set over the summer. A work session on economic trends and forecasting assumptions will be held prior to the submission of requested budgets. Update exhibit D as appropriate. Uh, Commissioner Rubio or Mr. Mayor, can I ask a clarifying question on this? Pertaining to this, sure. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Rubio, can you provide, um, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to get, what problem you're trying to solve or get at here. Um, and if it's appropriate, I'm seeing Tim nod his head. Uh, could, could I, could yeah, I suggest, I what, let me second it. I second it so it's on the table. Let's, let's put all the amendments that are going to be on the table on the table. And then as we go through them individually, we can yeah. ask lots of questions. And, it's, and that is not intended to be a hostile question here. I actually don't know what's going on. Okay. Yeah, I, just, I just want to get through everybody's amendments and then, then we'll, we, so uh, uh, Commissioner Rubio lets you and I try to remember. Commissioner Maps has a question on that one in particular. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner Rubio moves Rubio to, I've seconded it. Commissioner Gonzalez, you have, I believe, three amendments you're proposing? That's correct, and we'll try to streamline this. I'll start with my comments for all three uh, before I read them into the record. With respect to amendment number one, this relates to low acuity medical calls and the overall allocation of public safety calls in our system. Since the dawn of the pandemic, we've seen a substantial increase in 911 calls clogging our system. Uh, this is particularly true for medical, whether low acuity or high acuity medical. We continue to evaluate the best methodology for allocating these calls that is both efficient and assures the highest quali quality medical care in the region. Uh, additionally, with charter reform implementation upon us, there's an opportunity to thoughtfully streamline public safety bureaus. And this note will speak to all, both of those aspects. Notes two and three are, are with respect to the fire bureau's overtime challenges in 22-23. Specifically, experienced substantial unplanned overtime in the current fiscal year. There are various con con contributors to this challenge, including change in lead policy and bargained contract term implementations, and both of our notes here will speak to those items. So, with respect to note one, budget note, Direction of call response and allocation reviews for medical response. The Office of the Commissioner of Public Safety is assigned coordinating responsibilities for City Transition Public Safety Service Area Group. The service area group is charged with submitting recommendations regarding the city's public safety structure within the city's new form of government, effective in January 2025. The service area group will submit recommendations to the city's chief administrative officer and city council for approval before October 31, 2023. The city's public safety structure as approved by city council will inform PF&R's staffing requirements in the city's public safety call response protocols. Strategies regarding staffing and call response shall be developed in coordination with the Commissioner of Public Safety, the city's public safety bureaus, Multnomah County, and the city budget office. The Commissioner of Public Safety shall sign a project manager responsible for the deliveries, deliverables identified in this budget note. The project manager shall regularly report the Commissioner of Public Safety and the Mayor's Office on pro project status for the duration of the review timeline. A report shall be presented to City Council by September 15th, 2023 to inform both future budget guidance and to allow for any workloads necessary for transitioning and planning to occur. Council shall prioritize additional funding to execute the plan and should alternative funds become available during fiscal year 23-24. It is recognized that this, this may be a multi-year effort to fully execute any transition of programming and identification of ongoing resources. This budget note represents direction to move forward towards a more sustainable funding and operational deployment model for non-emergent and lower acuity medical call response. That was a mouthful. One more paragraph here. Uh, analyze evaluating alternative response protocols shall consider the rapid response vehicle, RRV program, the community health ass assess and treat, CHAP program, and Portland Street response, 
as well as opportunities to revise ambulance response services with Multnomah County. Update Exhibit D as appropriate. Gonzalez moves. Uh, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Mapps seconds. Budget note two, overtime analysis and reporting structure for Portland Fire and Rescue. Portland Fire and Rescue experienced unparalleled overtime spend in 22-23 and recently engaged in outside analysis of how to remedy going forward. PF&R will complete the analysis of overtime spend and provide recommendations on long-term solutions. The Commissioner of Public Safety shall assign a project manager responsible for the deliverables identified in this budget note. Analysis shall include the impacts of the following, collective bargaining agreement, future retirements, upcoming 27 paid period lookbacks, potential impacts of Oregon's Paid Family Medical Leave Act on daily staffing models, appropriate size of the traveler's pool, potential strategies for overtime avoidance. The project manager shall regularly report to the Commissioner of Public Safety and the Mayor's Office on project status for the duration of the review timeline. A report shall be presented to City Council by September 15th, 2023 to inform both future budget guidance and to allow for any workload necessary for transitioning and planning to occur. Council shall prioritize additional funding to execute the plan should alternative funds become available during fiscal year 23-24. Is recognized this may be a multi-year effort to fully execute a plan to address overtime pay. Update Exhibit D as appropriate. Commissioner Gonzalez moves. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Maps. Amendment number three, note three, realign 400,000 in one-time general fund discretionary resources allocated to the Community Safety Division in the Office of Management and Finance to the Portland Fire Bureau, Bureau for onboarding and training new firefighters. The Community Safety Division in the Office of Management and Finance shall realign 400,000 one-time general funds discretionary resources carried over to the fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget for a community safety strategic plan to the Fort Portland Fire Bureau to support onboarding and training new firefighters. To effectuate this change to the fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget, the amendment decreases the Community Safety Division's general fund one-time revenue and associated program expenses by 400,000 and increases the Fire Bureau's budget by the commensurate amount, resulting in a net neutral budget realignment. The CSD will no longer have a dedicated resource for their strategic plan without their own internal realignment. Update attachment B and C as appropriate. Second. Second. Commissioner uh, Gonzalez moves uh, all second. Gonzalez three. Commissioner Ryan. Yes. <clears throat> Colleagues, since being assigned the service uh, area cluster area by the mayor in January, our office picked up on the work Commissioner Rubio started to evaluate and align art spending with the goals and priorities of our city. My goal has been to prepare for our new form of city government while simultaneously trying to enhance and deliver on the city's promise of supporting artists and arts organizations in Portland. I'm delighted that my colleagues on City Council recognize the crucial importance of establishing a centralized and robust Office of Arts and Culture for the future of arts and culture in our city. The new Office of Arts and Culture will serve as a catalyst for streamlining initiatives, improving efficiency, and fostering collaboration within our vibrant arts community. It will also provide direct access to city services, resources, and valuable opportunities for growth and development of our creative economy. Throughout this period of government transition, I have passionately advocated for increased funding for the arts in Portland, and I'm unwavering in my commitment to ensuring uninterrupted grant-making activities for artists and arts organizations in our city. My goal is to have the Office of Arts and Culture operational by June of 2024, ensuring a lasting positive impact on the artistic landscape of our beloved city and my hometown. So, the budget note. Assignment of City Arts Program and Future Agreements. Commissioner Dan Ryan and City Arts Program have undertaken a comprehensive evaluation of the city's arts-related services, seeking to align arts spending with city goals and policies to enhance support for artists and arts organizations, but providing more direct services, resources, and opportunities for growth and development. Recognizing the immense value and impact of investing in our city's artistic community including artists, arts organizations, cultural events, and the broader creative economy, the City Council has determined the need for a centralized and robust Office of Arts and Culture to oversee and streamline efforts, enhance efficiency, and foster collaboration within the arts community, and provide support for the development 
promotion and preservation of arts and culture throughout Portland. The City Arts Program will begin the process of reallocating staffing and contract investments to the establishment of the Office of Arts and Culture with the target date of completion of June 2024, update attachment D as appropriate. Commissioner Ryan moves. Second. Get a second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. That's Ryan one. On to Ryan two. Okay, colleagues, over the past four years, the City of Portland across multiple bureaus has awarded over 300 million in grants to local nonprofits, and the city needs to do a better on ensuring we set clear goals and outcomes. For example, the Portland Clean Energy Fund paused its grant rolling out to make sure its grant programs were being aligned with its core guiding principles. There's still much more work to do here. That said, leadership must include the humility, and I appreciate the openness to improve PSEF. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Our overall grant-making habits as a city should use this example of real-time editing as a best practice across the entire city. As it relates to the Office of Community and Civic Life, we need all our partners that receive grants to align and deliver on the core mission of the office, being an objective convener and building civic engagement. I've asked the Bureau to work with the District Coalition Offices, Diversity and Civic Leadership Programs, Multnomah Youth Commission, New Portlanders Policy Commission, and East Portland Action Plan to ensure alignment on shared goals and outcomes to increase the impact of the city's investment and grant making. I look forward to all of you being thought partners as we improve accountability and build community results when partnering with our community organizations. Budget note reads, outgoing city grants policy and process review. The Office of Community and Civic Life in partnership with the Office of Management and Finance Grants Management Division will develop a comprehensive process and transparency framework for community grants in the city of Portland. In addition to ensuring equity and inclusivity, the new framework will require clear accounting, measurable goals, robust community engagement, and transparent reporting. We aim to ensure accountability and fiscal responsibility and mutually desired goals. Update attachment D as appropriate. Second. Commissioner uh, Ryan moves. Commissioner Rubio seconds Ryan too. And then I have a joint one, Ryan and Rubio. Do you want me to start it here? Okay. I was pleased to work, uh, work with uh, Commissioner Rubio and the mayor's office to bring this amendment forward. The funding shift, along with the realloc reallocation of civic life funds, we were able to, pro to overcome the budget shortfall caused by the shift in liquor, noise, and cannabis to BDS and Prosper. Thanks to the combined work, civic life will maintain full funding of the diversity and civic leadership program in the upcoming fiscal year, while also investing in district coalition offices serving historically under-resourced areas of our city, as well as a small grants program which serves thousands of Portlanders, including members of BIPOC, immigrant and refugee, LB, LGBTQ+, and other at-risk communities. These adjustments will cover the budget gap for the upcoming fiscal year. We will work together to determine a long-term solution. One time, the, it reads as follows. One-time funding for the Diversity and Civic Leadership DCL program. The Diversity and Civic Leadership DCL Program and the Office of Community and Civic Life will receive $250,000 of general fund one-time discretionary funds to support the program grants in fiscal year 23-24. To recognize these resources, increase general fund beginning balance by $250,000 on a one-time basis. The resource supporting this increase is underspending in the intergovernmental agreement with the Joint Office of Homeless Services increased program expenses in the DCL program, in the Office of Community and Civic Life, and general fund discretionary resources. Update attachment B and C as appropriate. Very good, Commissioner Ryan moves. Is there a second? I would assume Commissioner Rubio, since second. you're jointly introducing it, you'd be happy to do that. Thanks. Great, uh, Commissioner Maps, do you have any amendments? I do indeed. <clears throat> Uh, I have an amendment to Wheeler, uh, Wheeler Amendment 6, which is the uh, issue which deals with uh, parking meter rates. And for those of you in the room or listening at home, here's an intuitive understanding of what's uh, happening. Uh, so the mayor uh, has introduced and Commissioner Ryan has seconded a budget amendment which would forgo a 40 cent 
increase in parking meter rates. Um, I am introducing what I hope is a friendly amendment to reduce the size of that reduction from 40 cents to 20 cents. Um, and the language for this, uh, which we can call MAPS Amendment 1, is, uh, here's the title, uh, reduce on-street metered parking by 40 cents per hour in the Portland uh, Bureau of Transportation fiscal year 2023-24 budget transportation operating fund. And the language of this amendment reads as thus. The Portland Bureau of Transportation general transportation revenue forecast and the FY 2023-24 proposed budget assumes a metered parking rate increase of 40 cents per hour which was approved by this council in February of 2024. That would be resolution 37564. The last metered parking rate increase occurred in 2016. This amendment reduces the incremental increase of 40 cents per hour in metered parking to 20 cents per hour. To enact this reduction, the parking fee revenue in the transportation operating fund will re be reduced by $4,150,000. To balance contingency in the transportation operating fund will be reduced by, I think there's a typo in there, but I would assume that should read $4,150,000 in fiscal year 2023-24, adding to ongoing program reductions, including reducing positions for fiscal year 2024-25. Update exhibits B, C, and D as appropriate. May I get a second? Can I do a point of order on this? Sure. Um, and I see what you're trying to do, and I, yeah. I appreciate it. I think there might be a legally cleaner way. To, I'm seeing lots of, of twitching yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm happy to do and this. So, um, why, why don't why don't we hear from budget office and legal counsel? I think what they're going to suggest. I, I realize what you're proposing competes directly with the amendment that I put on the table. Yep. And I think what they're going to recommend is that they be two separate amendments voted on separately. Is is that what? Uh, you're, I'm so go go for it. Clarify. Sir, Christy Allen, Assistant Budget Director. Um, I think our first question was, is this an amendment to amend Wheeler 6, or is this the introduction of MAPS 1 for a 20 cent? That is a great question, and I, I think in the hustle and bustle of this afternoon, uh, I don't know, when I read this, it looks like a separate amendment, uh, um, although I think it has been framed. That would be, that would be my preference, because I, I think it gets, because it, it gets messy to amend an amendment and um, I, I would rather they be separate competing structures. Yes, I think one point that That's we good. discussed briefly was only one can pass. Correct. Because if both pass. Yeah, they're, they're, they're mutually exclusive. I yes. agree with that, that but sense. this isn't the first time we've done that. <laughs> okay, yeah. right? I mean, uh, I, uh, point of order. Um, whose amendment gets voted on first? In the order of introduction. The order of what, sorry? In the order of introduction, in the order that we've read them, they'll be voted on. And I, as legal counsel, I would also rather see it as MAPS Amendment 1 and not an amendment to an amendment, but as its own. Uh, I'm fine. Do I have to read this again, or can we, give them the way I put it on the table, are we good to go? I think as long as you can clarify that you're moving forward yep. with this as MAPS Amendment 1 and not an amendment to Wheeler... Six. Sure. Uh, hi, folks. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, introduce a separate amendment. We'll call it MAPS 1. Uh, what it basically does is it proposes a 20 cent uh, increase in our parking meter rates. Great. And uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, did you have a question before I ask for a second? I mean, it's a little bit of procedural or point of order, and then it, it's a question for the chair as well. The, the point of order, um, is there any fundamental barrier to an amendment to an amendment? So I would really only want to see an amendment to an amendment once the initial amendment had 
passed or if we'd gone on for further colloquy on that issue. It's not procedurally appropriate right now. So I, I hate to argue against myself, but I'll, I'll <laughs> tell you why you can't do it. Um, because in order to get the amendment passed, you have to vote for my base amendment first. And um, I, it's just cleaner if we separate these. And, and colleagues, it's, it feels messy, but we do this a lot actually in budget processes where there's an honest disagreement of opinion about a particular uh, aspect of one of these, and we put them up as competing alternatives. It's, it, it actually isn't that messy. It may feel that messy, but it, I'd prefer that rather than amendment to an amendment. That's just me. But if, if you feel strongly about it, and I'll, I'll defer to my colleague, uh, Commissioner Maps, on this. The, the primary, and this is as much a question for the chair, I, I just, or at least I'm hopeful that we will be at something more than three to two on this. At least that's my hope. Um, and uh, so the interest in, in getting it all tidy in one was that it affords us an opportunity to show some agreement on this. But I may be mistaken and uh, where people stand and, uh, and take seriously your, your general point about usual process here. Can I ask a question? Uh, um, so we're going to vote in this. The first amendment we vote on is Commissioner or Wheeler Six, uh, which uh, eliminates the increase in parking uh, meter revenues, um, and only one amendment here can survive. Uh, so if we vote on Wheeler Six and um, it passes, then. 20 minutes later, we vote on maps one. Or do we still vote on maps one if Wheeler six passes? I think procedurally at that point, you could move to withdraw your motion, or you could go through the formality of voting on it, knowing what the outcome would already be. All right. Um, I'll keep my amendment on the table. Um, we will vote on Wheeler six if Wheeler six passes the first time around. Um, that seems to negate maps one. Is that the basic dynamic here? Correct. All right, I hope my colleagues understood that. Um, I vaguely do, and uh, we can let this thing play out. We do need a second. Oh, uh, oh thank you. Second. Uh, second from Commissioner Gonzalez to maps number one. All right, our colleagues, are there any other amendments? Okay, so why don't we do this? Ordinarily, what you know, you know, we would do here is we would take initial questions, then we'll hear public testimony. I think we have, what, 15, 20 people signed up for public testimony. Then a second round of questions. So are there initial questions people would like to ask staff while they're sitting here and comfortable in their chairs? And then we'll go to public testimony and reopen it for discussion and or questions of staff. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I have, uh, thank you. I, I'll direct this to Tim, uh, probably most appropriately. I think a, a quick explainer on Rubio 2. This deals with a new system or a centralized system for coordinating budget forecasts. And the confusing thing for me here is I think of our economist as developing uh, fiscal forecasts and revenue forecasts. Um, so how is this different? How is the amendment proposed by Rubio here different from current practices? And what problem are you trying to solve? Cur current, let me start by saying that the way we forecast in the general fund is the, our city economist collaborates with other economists in the state. And they try to get a fix on assumptions that they're using in their forecast. The state has some different forecasts than we would have, but yeah. nevertheless, they're looking at economic trends. We don't have a forum like that currently within the city. And we would like to formalize having the forecasters in water, the forecasters in environmental services, PBOT, wherever those people are, that they come together to collaborate on what economic trends are looking like, what they're seeing and changes in their assumptions, and then coming to council and reporting on their findings as well as their methodologies for how they're going to go forward in the forecasting and presenting their financial plans. 
And we want to do that earlier in the process as soon as we think we can get a good grasp on trends. So that's what we're trying to create here. Okay, I, no, I'm, I'm, uh, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, the only, does this impact all bureaus? And are we, so you mentioned a, a question is uh, general fund versus let's say utilities and whatnot. Uh, I think BDS actually has a, some very sophisticated BDS, yeah. and yes. kind of in, interesting yeah. forecasting models. Right. So in general, this would apply we, to... We, it would be mostly the larger bureaus that either have fees as a primary source or rates as a primary source. And in the case of the general fund, we have all kinds of resources we have to do assumptions on. This isn't aimed at having every bureau in the city um, participating in this. We would share our findings with everybody. All right, that's fine. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate the clarification. And we'll, we'll be providing more information as we go forward on how this will operate and um, what the procedures will be. All right, very good. Uh, any other questions at this particular juncture? If not, we'll jump right into public testimony. Uh, how many folks do we have signed up, Keelan? We have 15. So. Very good. Um, I'll call the first three. I believe they're all joining us in person. Uh, you're welcome to come up to the testimony table. Kevin Machise, Rob Martineau, and Susan Johnson. What's missing? There, you said there was a PowerPoint slide. Yeah, let me check. Oh. Someone else go first. I'm third. Should someone else go first while you're waiting? Oh, oh, sure. Hello, um, Mayor, Whe uh, <laughs> Mayor Wheeler, um, Commissioner Maps, Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Rubio, and Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the city's 2023-2024 budget. My name is Susan Johnson. I am co-chair of the Portland Bureau of Transportation's Bureau of Budget Advisory Committee. I'm testifying on behalf of myself and am not representing the BBAC. It is extremely disappointing to see a last minute amendment to, well, so, several last minute amendments to the PBOT's budget um, that would cut four to eight million from their budget without any discussion with the community, much less the volunteer community I co-chair that is tasked with helping the Portland Bureau of Transportation director develop a yearly budget. As you know, the Portland Bureau of Transportation's financial situation is untenable and unsustainable into the future. But this very modest increase to parking rates is crucial um, to maintaining key services in the Bureau. Please do not support either of these amendments and please support the Portland Bureau of Transportation in, coming, in the coming year as we grapple with its future and what services we will need to cut to balance the budget in the future years. Thank you. Thank you. Short and to the point. Thank you. Okay. Keelan, are we waiting for a PowerPoint? Is that yeah? I think it's on? ready. We're getting okay. it pulled up right now. Sorry for the delay. Here it comes. I see it. Thank you, I'm Kevin Matches. I'm a CFA charter holder. Council has been discussing the desire to reduce tax burden here in Portland. I know how the city can reduce $2 billion of property taxes. I'm going to show you how. Turning to the next slide, look at a property tax bill. Portland Fire and Police Pension comprises about 10% of the total bill. According to the mayor's proposed budget, this will consume over 30% of the city's annual property taxes. A city-run pension system called FPDR covers police and firefighters first sworn before 2007. Turning to the next slide. The charter defines the funding policy and puts the plan on a pay-as-you-go basis. Property taxes pay benefit payments as they come due in retirement, but no money is ever set aside to fund pensions before benefit payments are due. This is a curse on the long-term financial condition 
of Portland, I urge the city to request its actuary provide an analysis of a comprehensive actuarial funding policy. The only two places in the United States using a pay-as-you-go uh, funding policy are Portland and Puerto Rico. Next slide. One important benefit uh, to getting off of pay-as-you-go is reducing cumulative long-term costs. Next slide. Portland has the most costly public pension system in the United States. The left side of this chart shows police and firefighters across Oregon. The right side shows Portland police and fire. And the important difference is the ludicrous annual actuarial costs associated with Portland's pensions, shown in red. It's costing Portland more than twice as much to employ a single member compared to the rest of Oregon. Next slide. Under the current funding policy shown here in green, cumulative costs of FPDR total $6.1 billion over the next 30 years, and over $8 billion through the end of the plan's life. Examples of alternative funding policies are shown in red. Next slide. A cursory analysis indicates that alternative policies could eliminate $1.9 to $2.6 billion of costs. That's property taxes. Next slide. I've urged the city to request its actuary provide the analysis. At the January 23 FPDR board meeting, one trustee made a motion to get a quote for such an analysis, but the mayor's designees was absent, and the other trustees did not second the motion, so the motion died. Any discussion about tax burdens would be woefully incomplete without an analysis. There are steps council can take immediately. First, fill the vacant board seat uh, with someone who will support a culture of transparency. Second, demand transparency in the form of an analysis of potential cost savings. Uh, next slide. Finally, independent national experts can engage directly with the city, but only by invitation. Thank you. First of all, I just want to applaud you as somebody who spends a lot of time on, on pension systems. Um, that was about the most complex issue explained very simply in three minutes perfectly. Um, well done. Thank you, and I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Rob Martineau. Welcome. Welcome. I, uh, thank you. My name is Rob Martineau. I am a member of AFSCME Local 189, and we represent 1,100 city employees across numerous bureaus. I want to start talking about those employees, or start by talking about those employees. I think it is insincere to bargain in good faith contracts for those employees and then effectively lay them off by failing to fund the services they provide. These amendments are going to harm Portland as a whole and undermine the ability of its bureaus to provide and maintain the service levels that they currently do. Budgeting is a challenge. I mean, that's an understatement in, in the current climate, and, and it has been, and I expect it will continue to be. But these changes would be a diversion from the short and long-term needs of Portlanders and the collective goals of our city. I think this will hurt our bond ratings. It will have impacts on the general fund. It will have impacts on the infrastructure bureaus, absolutely. This could absolutely be a spark for generational financial inequity that we would begin by doing this and then moving those costs further and, and putting those on, on future generations. I think this will artificially hold down rates and we will again be faced with the same issue next year and the year after and the year after. And the time is now to fix this and this was done in a responsible way. These amendments feel like a knee-jerk reaction uh, that I fully don't I will say I don't fully understand the, the need for this. I understand tax fatigue. I understand I don't want to pay more taxes than I have to. I don't think I'm alone in that. But these are necessary things to have our city be the place we want it to be. Deferring this is not the answer. We've got a fixing our streets program because we failed to fix our streets. We don't need to defer this again. I think that these amendments will harm those that they purport to help. And I think that the really accurate analogy to what these amendments will do is, be, is to press the skip a payment button on our obligations. They will compound. It's always a bad idea to take that skip a payment if you're you know, offered that. And, and we would just compound that bad idea by pushing this forward onto future generations. So I would ask that you reject these changes and, and not take the opportunity to compound our obligations and, and further encumber Portland. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Michael Anderson, followed by Kyle Johnson and Zach Lesher. Go ahead, Michael. 
Hello, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Michael Anderson. I'm a senior researcher and transportation policy lead with Sightline Institute. I'm here to comment on parking fees. Sightline takes no position on the proposals before you, though we agree with the many people you hear from today saying that public services have value and deserve funding. Instead, I want to make a broader point. Though raising fees will never be popular, parking fees are a little unusual in that higher fees can sometimes have an offsetting benefit to people driving. My son is six. He's obsessed with Minecraft. The other day, I drove to the downtown Powell's at 6 p.m. in search of the next volume in a series of Minecraft novels. I thought car would be faster than bike until it took me 20 minutes just to find a parking space. Every curbside for half a mile around was full. I ended up drive parking in the underground lot by Whole Foods and stopping to get some bacon to avoid the parking fee. This is stupid. I shouldn't be paying Jeff Bezos for overpriced bacon so that I can park for free after 20 minutes of driving in circles around downtown. Instead, the city should be opening up curbside space by charging another dollar per hour to park on the curbs in the South Pearl and extending paid hours into the evenings and using that revenue to continue providing valuable public services. If Portland's curbsides were a hot dog stand, then in some neighborhoods, you, the city council, would be selling out of hot dogs before dinner every day. As any business owner in the city would tell you, the thing to do in that situation is to raise the price of your hot dog and reinvest the revenue in your operation. That's especially true if your hot dog stand is going broke and you're considering laying off the guy who cooks your hot dogs. I'm not saying Portland should raise every parking price. Some curbs in some hours are nearly empty. Don't raise those prices, lower them. People are currently overpaying for par parking on those curbs. In other words, I'm urging you to use the policy that this council passed in 2018, but has never actually implemented to create new meter and permit districts and regularly adjust parking prices in all districts based on demand, as in San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Calgary, Los Angeles, Baltimore, DC, Madrid, Rotterdam, and elsewhere. Not everyone will love this, but it is a way to make city life work a little better and boost access to businesses while raising money for public purposes. That's why you passed that policy in 2018, and that's why you should direct your staff to implement it right away. Thanks. Next up, we have Kyle Johnson. Hello, Mayor and City Councilors. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Kyle Johnson, and I'm on the board of Bike Loud PDX. I'm here today to express my concern about removing the proposed parking rate increases. Taking away this revenue from the Portland Bureau of Transportation would cripple the Bureau for many years and make it nearly impossible for us to achieve the modal and safety goals we need to do to create a more livable city. The loss of personnel and experience at, at PBOT would take significantly more resources to retain in the future. Bike Loud's mission is to hold the city accountable to its goal of 25% of all trips being made by bike by 2030. A city where 25% of all trips are made by bike is one where our roads have less wear, where our kids can walk and bike to school or the park by themselves, and where community is built into our streets. According to the latest bike counts, we are moving backwards on this goal. We need to be dedicating more smart funding towards PBOT to achieve this goal, not less. It will not be possible to make any meaningful advances towards this goal or other important goals, such as redu reducing traffic deaths with such a huge drop in funding as the one being proposed today. As people who ride bikes, these cuts are especially impactful. How we design our streets is a matter of life and death. Right now, too many of our streets are designed only for private automobiles. These cuts will mean more Portlanders are putting their lives on the line each time they go out and use our streets by bike. And too many others will decide it's not worth the risk. The city's parking survey found that 96% of people would not be influenced by this increase. But when you ride a bike, you notice when there is glass in the road because, because it has not been maintained or a protected bike lane that has been scaled back because of funding and the project just ends in the middle of nowhere. Making a city where the only way to get around by car will make it more expensive to live in Portland. AAA puts the cost of car ownership at $10,000 a year. Portlanders should not have to pay $10,000 a year to access our roads. It's this council's job to make sure these public goods are used to the maximum public benefit. Forcing such a large cut to a bureau that is already underfunded and backlogged is not a good way to manage these public goods. The full 40 cent parking increase is fair in line with what our peer cities are charging for parking, improves access to our central city, 
and creates its value several times over in community benefits. Please do not defund our roads. Thank you for your consideration. Next up, we have Zach Lesher. Hi there, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Zachary Lesher. I'm testifying regarding the planned parking fee increase that's being put into jeopardy by this uh, meeting. I'm concerned about this because the narrative that is being put forth is that commissioners need to make do with less in order to be good stewards of public funds. I object to this, particularly when it comes to parking fees, because the cost of not implementing the multimodal safety projects that the parking fee increase would pay for is, high, is far higher than the cost of the fee increase. There are high costs to a community that result from unsafe streets. There are medical costs to residents, mounting maintenance costs for roads as people wear them down from choosing inefficient modes of travel, worsening air quality, and the mental and physical health toll of sedentary lifestyles multiplied by tens of thousands of people every day. All of these have costs to our city, both in terms of real expenditures and lost revenues and an external cost in terms of the well-being of Portland's residents. I'm fairly new to Portland, and when I moved here, I made the decision to not buy a car. I personally save money doing this because I'm not paying for car payments, fuel, maintenance, insurance, and so on. Our region saves money from this decision because I don't contribute to the congestion, worsening air quality, noise pollution, or unsafe streets. I'm statistically more likely to shop at neighborhood businesses than at big box stores. I say this to emphasize that this decision was only possible because the products that were paid for by the revenue sources like the one that's on the chopping block today. I use the Blumenauer Bridge, the Cooch Street Rose Lane, the NATO protected bike lane and our wonderful greenway network on a daily basis. And every day when people are encouraged by projects like these to make a trip somehow other than a car, this creates a virtuous cycle that makes the streets safer and more welcoming to the next person from the city who's making the same change. I urge the commission to not to gut these crucial programs and instead invest in our city's future by raising the parking costs to 40 cents that were planned. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Chris Smith, followed by Rachel Whiteside and Mark Porras. Go ahead, Chris. Mayor Wheeler, members of council, uh, I'm Chris Smith. I sometimes appear here as a lobbyist for the No More Freeways campaign. Today, I'm testifying on my own behalf. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as a citizen budget advisor to this council for six years uh, under the, the ten years of Mayor Adams and Hales. And prior to that, I also served on the PBOT Budget Advisory Committee. Uh, the trajectory of PBOT's budget has been clear uh, for that whole time and for many years since, and we find ourselves at a very dire place. That was delayed by the introduction of a local gas tax. Uh, Commissioner Maps, I would note I was also a member of the last task force to look at a utility fee. Uh, that collapsed uh, under the effort to find an equitable and politically viable uh, rate schedule that would apply to different land use types. If you're brave enough to try that again, I commend you. Uh, it will be hard work. Um, absent this overdue increase uh, in parking fees that my friend Michael has um, so well articulated, uh, PBOT uh, is basically going out of business. Uh, I would urge you not to allow that to happen. Uh, I would also point out that parking fees are good policy, not just for the reasons that Michael articulated, uh, but both under the city's POEM effort and in Metro's research on pricing methods for the transportation system, uh, parking fees align very strongly with our city and regional goals. Uh, they are in fact a climate policy. So I urge you to allow the full 40 cent fee increase to go into effect. It's overdue and it's a good policy for the city and has multiple benefits. Thank you very much. Next up we have Rachel Whiteside. Thank you. Good evening. I'm here on behalf of Protect 17, and I speak today to urge you to vote no on all of the budget amendments that have been put on the table uh, that would re dramatically reduce the city's ability to provide vital services for the people of Portland. Protect 17 represents over 900 City of Portland employees who provide the professional and technical services across almost all city bureaus. A large portion of our members are engineers and technicians who work on the design, inspection, and maintenance of the city's infrastructure. This includes water and wastewater, pipes and plants, uh, streets and transportation facilities, a wide range of parks facilities, and affordable housing projects and permitting. These professionals are directly tasked with finding the most cost-effective way of performing these essential city services. They have directly faced the dramatic and unexpected increases in construction costs over the past two years and the impact it has already had on their project delivery. 
Under the incredibly difficult constraints of rising external costs, countless hours have already been spent to optimize the city's plans for cost effectiveness during the regular budget cycle. The amendments before you today disregard this professional expertise, as well as the public input from budget advisory committees and the public utility board, and the long-term planning that is built into these programs to make sure that rate increases are both responsible and that the city is spending money wisely. By cutting utility rates and waiving SDCs, council is uh, demanding budget cuts without the benefit of proper planning, and the Pressing constraints on project delivery will only increase uh, and city work will slow. And I'm speaking from experience here because I was at BDS during the Great Recession uh, and I saw it firsthand. There will be less maintenance of critical water and sewer pipes, fewer safety improvements to transportation facilities, and a slower inspection process of affordable housing projects that is, this council is rightly prioritizing in the budget. Short-term cuts to maintenance budgets never save money they only defer costs to a later date uh, as the backlog of projects grow and result in more expensive fixes later. This isn't politics, this is just engineering. Our members are working people who are subject to the same economic stresses that all Portlanders are facing. They experience the same rent hikes, shocking prices at the grocery store, and high fuel costs. And like most Portlanders, their wages have not kept up with inflation and they feel the burden of increased taxes. But to see their work undermined by sudden budget cuts, which always come with the potential threat of layoffs, is tremendously harmful to both your workforce and the community. The people of Portland do not want slower permitting and degraded infrastructure. They want vibrant parks, accessible streets, and safe drinking water. I urge you to take a step back from this hasty plan that will undermine and underfund the city's critical responsibilities and core services. Thank you. Next up, we have Mark Porras. Yep, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. According to the most recent Portland Police Bureau sworn <coughs> staffing report that was posted online today, there are 77 sworn vacancies and 98 officers in training who are not yet on the streets. These 175 positions <coughs> comprise around 20% of the Bureau. The City Budget Office's analysis of PPB's budget states that the inherent trade-off of carrying too many vacant funded positions is that the funds will not be spent on additional new hires, but on vacant positions. They state that it is not expected that the Bureau will need funding for the 43 positions in fiscal year 2023-24, and we urge you to remove funding for those 43 positions. So even for people who want to undo the lessons the city supposedly learned in the Black Lives Matter uprising, who somehow believe that the answer to crime, poverty, and violence is to throw money at police instead of redirecting it, you must first wait for these 175 officers to be out on the streets before you take more money away from human needs and give it to a militarized branch of our government. This morning, we testified on a police brutality settlement that cost the taxpayers $50,000, not including the amount of money spent by risk management and the city attorneys to settle the case. And this morning's settlement also raised the total paid out for PPB behavior during protests between 2018 and 2020 to at least $1,254,405. And we, we also noted that the DOJ settlement agreement states the city make available the number, nature, and settlement amount of civil suits against PPB officers, regardless of whether the city is a defendant in the litigation. And we're still waiting for the city to make these data readily available to the public. Um, Street Roots actually recently published data showing that the city spends more paying its lawyers than it does making whole those who file city cl civil claims. And that should alarm everyone. And there is no way to discern this from the budget you're presenting to the public today. Furthermore, every settlement for police misconduct and brutality should come directly out of PPB's budget. That includes, includes any and all legal expenses. In Minneapolis, they talked about needing to acquire insurance for each officer so that those who committed the worst or repeated acts would become uninsurable and lose their jobs. Portland should consider adopting this model as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Jacob Brostoff followed by Kimberly Goheen Alban and Will Hollingsworth. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Greetings. I'm Jacob Rostoff. I'm a member of Ask Me Local 189. I work as a Safe Blocks Program Coordinator at the Community Safety Division, and I appreciate giving, you giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about the intergenerational equity impacts of these proposed amendments. Uh, 
It's unfair to people who have previously paid in, and it's unfair to future Portlanders whose money will go less far than it would have otherwise as we defer things that are going to break more, uh, suffer from inflation, and potentially impacted bond ratings. Peabot's reserves are dangerously low, uh, and this is kind of creating a rainy day for a bureau with no rainy day fund. I'm very concerned about the ripple effects of layoffs and bumping. Our city coworkers are already quite understaffed. Uh, for example, there are mandatory 12-hour shifts at the wastewater treatment plant right now because they can't hire enough workers. Um, and I'm also concerned about the safety impacts of having fewer Portlanders at work for the city. So uh, we hear in our union repeatedly from workers all the time who are isolated and in unsafe conditions due to lack of colleagues. Um, folks at Peabot complain about that a lot. In summary, I just want to say I think this is a really bad idea to make these cuts, um, and I would appreciate you reconsidering uh, these ideas. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Next up, we have Kimberly Goheen Albon. Yes, this is Kimberly Goheen Albon, live citizen of Clark County, your sister county. Um, <clears throat> I took an oath and uh, I'm a senior citizen and, and I'm gonna be speaking about your budget of which I do not claim uh, to begin knowing um, much about it. Uh, the citizens are doing a good job. That's all I'm out to do is wake up citizens to what's going on and this is what's going on. This council is a United Nations member of the ICLEI and it's not following the constitution. Anything they pass, and I'll quote Mayor Wheeler, whether good or not so good will pass. That gives the government telling we the people how to spend our hard-earned tax dollars instead of we the people governing our local government. My goal is to wake up all citizens up to assemble as their local governments, um, such as Portland, is not the only ICLEI uh, membership undermining American citizens. Uh, there is Vancouver City Council. They're 15-year members of the United Nations, NATO. So is Seattle, Bellingham, uh, Olympia, name a few in Washington State, under criminal Inslee, um, Oregon City, Mo uh, Milwaukee, Eugene, Salem, Newburgh, and Bend, to mention a few cities across America with local governments that comply to the United Nations and not the Constitution. That's the problem, folks. When you uh, wake up and stand up now, you'll understand why all this, it'll answer all of your questions uh, to take down America for their agenda, which is a twofold, and this is not me, this is them, uh, to have a one world order through the uh, mayors and councils, and then to depopulate. And that's another whole nightmare right there. They wanna depopulate us. This council must get out of the United Nations membership to the ICLEI and transition back to following the constitution and gain back the trust in our local government. Not all American cities are following the cr criminal Biden. And by the way, citizens, must discern for themselves and listen to our local FM radio station 101.1 daily to the truth and a better understanding of what is really happening. This United Nations agenda requires the government to control every aspect of your lives, including our police, our fire department. Notice how the government is intertwining our own services. And um, when citizens assemble, uh, it lets the government know that they are overreaching by making policy changes that sound good, but actually uh, float uh, hard-earned tax dollars among themselves. Much of the American Reef-Through Plan uh, uses our hard-earned tax dollars and must be spent within a certain amount of frame time or it's gone. They won't get it, and that's why they, they try to push these right now because pretty soon America is going to wake up. Um, on a sadder note, citizens must um, also look up geoengineeringwatch.org and view the video, The Dimming, and you'll better understand why lead in our water is a minute compared to how uh, we have polluted our earth and how climate engineers are killing us, uh, d just killing us flat out. It's a, it's a nightmare, but knowing the truth will make you free. Amen. Uh, the change of subject, but solar panel, put solar panels on schools and other public buildings as uh, you purchase those. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Will Hollingsworth. Uh. <laughs> Hard act to follow. Uh, good afternoon, <laughs> commissioners. My name is Will Hollingsworth. I'm a resident of Portland. I'm commenting today to strenuously oppose Wheeler Amendment 6. 
The amendment removes the 40 cent per hour rate increase to the city's parking meters and will deprive the Portland Bureau of Transportation of approximately $8.3 million during the next fiscal year. The Bureau is already overburdened and underfunded and a further reduction in potential revenue will only add to the Bureau's troubles. Depriving PBOT of revenue at this juncture is wildly irresponsible. This amendment endangers critical active transportation programs, basic street maintenance, and the ability of PBOT to carry out its major responsibilities. Maintaining the right of way is a core municipal function. It is not a nicety, it is not a luxury, it is not a thing we afford ourselves only when times are flush. It is a bedrock city service. Portland streets, sidewalks, and active transportation infrastructure are in obvious states of disrepair. We have seen an explosion in deaths in the roadway and the collapse of active transportation and bicycling within this city. Every dollar deprived to PBOT compounds these problems. Fiscal austerity doesn't fill sinkholes. It doesn't sweep bicycle lanes. It doesn't build missing sidewalks. It doesn't protect our children on their way to school. But it does let those sinkholes grow. It does let the bicycle network fester and crumble, and it does leave Portlanders to walk through the mud as cars stream past them. It leaves our children and our seniors, all of us, vulnerable to the ever-increasing risks of doing such incredibly reckless things as crossing the damn street. The mayor's amendment reeks of craven politicking, and it endangers the ability of the city to carry out its bedrock functions. It should be rejected by the council. Thank you. Next up, we have Indy Nam Kung, followed by Laura Galino de Lovato. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. For the record, my name is Indy Nam Kung. I'm the Transportation Justice Coordinator for Verde. Verde's mission is to serve communities by building environmental wealth through social enterprise, outreach, and advocacy. I'm here today to comment on Mayor Wheeler's Amendment 6 and now the newly proposed Amendment 1 from Commissioner Maps. Commissioners, I urge you not to adopt these amendments. Our understanding is that these cuts would likely impact climate, safety, equity, maintenance, and operations first, from active transportation programming, safe routes to school, Sunday parkways, to plowing roads in East Portland after a winter storm so people can get to work. PBOT has already cut $20 million from their budget over the last four budget cycles, and an additional cut of this scale would be devastating, particularly when the Bureau has had little opportunity to plan for a cut like this and has reasonably anticipated this revenue since early 2022. Equity and climate work are often cut first and deepest in these situations, but these things aren't fringe to basic transportation functions. They're essential to meeting our climate goals, reducing the air pollution and traffic violence that disproportionately harm communities of color and low-income communities, and building a transportation network that will work for us for decades to come. The funding challenges facing PBOT are not unique to our city either. The Oregon Department of Transportation's budget is anticipated to enter the red in the next couple of biennia. In Oregon and in many other states across the country, legislators are contending with a crisis in transportation funding. As cars get more fuel efficient, electric vehicles become more common and remote and hybrid work options have opened up to more people, funding mechanisms like the gas tax have seen revenues go into free fall ac across the country. This is a crisis that's been taking shape for decades and it will require partners at all levels of government to work together to build thoughtful and creative solutions. It's also critical that these future funding mechanisms are tuned into burden, equity, and environmental justice, incentivizing and supporting clean, safe, affordable transportation options for everyone, and particularly communities who have been overburdened and underserved by the system of the past. But today we can't throw our umbrella away in a rainstorm, and we can't afford to throw away a reasonable mechanism to keep the lights on at PBOT and sustain the critical safety, maintenance, and climate work that our communities are depending on while this larger conversation takes place. Commissioners, please reject these last minute cuts and retain the current parking rate in the 2023 and 2024 budget. Thank you. Next up, we have Laura Galino de Lovato. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Laura Galino de Lovato. I'm the executive director of Northwest Pilot Project. I'm also a commissioner on the city's rental services commission and serve on the county's continuum of care board. 
Uh, the mission of Northwest Pilot Project is to provide a life of dignity and hope to extremely low-income seniors in Multnomah County by providing housing and transportation solutions. We serve older adults, age 55 and over, who are the fastest growing segment of the homeless population. And very uh, heartbreakingly, we are seeing more homeless older adults over age 70 on our streets who need access to rent assistance and case management support in Multnomah County. After 53 and a half years of experience providing services to older adults and low income people, we know that the best way to address the homeless and housing crisis we have is through permanent housing. We're a small but mighty organization that serves about 600 to 700 seniors a year, both placing them in housing from homelessness or temporary housing or shelter, and also preventing them from eviction, one of the best upstream ways to prevent homelessness. We were really happy to see that the city uh, continued to fund the joint office. Um, we believe that the city's funds are really critical to the joint office funding, despite the massive infusion of funds that the joint office has gotten from the very important supportive housing services measure. I personally wish that the, we weren't seeing a 24% reduction in the joint in the city's joint office funding relative to last fiscal year, but I understand the one-time issue. I'm here today to advocate that the commission and city council reconsider adding back in additional funds specifically earmarked for direct service workers of social service and human service organizations to increase their wages to a livable housing wage in Multnomah County so that we can retain staff and better serve the low income homeless people that we work with. I also want to recommend that the city uh, engage with us as service providers and leverage our expertise. We know this work, we know the population, and we're open, ready, ready willing, and able to partner with you to address this issue. Thank you. Mayor, that completes testimony. Sorry about that. A lot of the testimony we just heard was related to the proposed increases in parking meter rates in downtown Portland. The current proposal is 40 cents per hour. The fiscal impact of not accepting that increase, I understand is about $8 million, correct? No. What percentage of the operating budget of Peabot is that? I can verify this with staff, but I believe the operating budget of PBOT is right around $200 million. So $8.3 million would be the percentage of that. And I sadly cannot do math in my head like that. So it'll be just a moment. And Four point. That's 5%, Four percent, basically. Four percent. Um, so, so give or take. So th there's a, a couple of things I, I just want to clarify that I heard repeated as people were testifying. Number one, this is not a cut. This is holding the line on proposed increases. The reason that services would be reduced as a result of this increase not going through is because the cost structure is growing at a very rapid rate. So isolated from what happens this year, we still have a problem with the cost structure in the delivery of services. That's a point I just want to make. Um, Others had suggested that without this fee increase, PBOT is broke. And again, you just made the case that they're not. Yes, it would require some tough choices and trade-offs, but it's hardly them being broke, and it's certainly not as a result of cuts. 
I also want to be clear because people said, well, this, this will bring to an end critical projects around uh, making sure that our city meets our climate action goals, et cetera, et cetera. It does not have to. The cuts do not have to come out of those critical projects. Uh, as you indicate, there are substantial other resources. And when you say the budget is 200 million-ish, that's just the operating budget. That does not include the capital budget. That is a completely separate amount that it totals what? The capital budget is about 202 million, I think. Um, and about 81% of it is either a dedicated or a grant resource, but 20% of it does come Four. from general transportation revenues. Very good. So a lot of the projects that people are referencing aren't, in fact, related to this at all. And I, I just want to make sure people understand that. So people are like, why are you doing this? We want people to stay. And I think people acknowledge that we are at an inflection point in our city. And studies now show that people are choosing not to stay here. They're moving their households, they're moving their places of employment, and they're choosing to invest elsewhere. We're at an inflection point, and I see this as a critical moment in the city's history, an unusual, unprecedented moment in the city's history that we should respond to. And from my perspective, at a time when we are fairly begging people to come to downtown Portland and see that we have improved the situation, and we have, there's still a ton of work to do, but we have improved the situation, and studies show that when people come to downtown Portland, they are twice as likely to have a favorable impression of the city of Portland than prior to coming to downtown Portland. So it's really important at this moment in our history for us not to send mixed signals to say, come to downtown Portland and oh, by the way, we're increasing the parking meter rates 40% per hour. To me, that just seems inconsistent. I agree with those who testified and, and Commissioner Maps made this point earlier uh, and he's 100% right the current funding model is fundamentally broken. And we had our good labor partners come forward and testify. Um, part of the cost escalation is the fact that the city is predominantly through operations providing public support, public employees who do the work of the city. That cost structure is running pretty hot right now. And we discuss that, of course, when we're in our collective bargaining with our labor partners. And so I, I just want to be clear, there's multiple problems here, none of which I believe would be fixed in one year, whether we approve the rate increase or don't improve the rate increase. We have a structural deficit that needs to be addressed. And it isn't just in PBOT. And I also want to acknowledge, uh, I put Commissioner Trapp Maps in PBOT, uh, not because it was easy, but because I knew he was up to the challenge. And, and he's done a terrific job, in my estimation, being the commissioner in charge of PBOT. But I want you to know why I'm thinking what I'm thinking about this. I'm concerned that people aren't seeing the value for the tax dollars, the fee increases, the utility rate increases. They're seeing that it's backed by studies. I believe that the programs and the policies that this council has put into place are showing good early results. And a year from now, the public will see the outcomes of those results. But in the near term, I'm asking us to hold the line and do everything we can to encourage people to stay here, to come here, to invest here, to bring their employees back to City of Portland. So I don't want people to think I've, I've lost my fiscal bearings. I most certainly have not. But I also see a bigger purpose here in terms of what we need to do over the course of the next year to rebuild confidence in the city of Portland. That's where I'm coming from on this. And thank you for answering my questions about the budget. I'll turn this over, uh, Commissioner Maps. Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you for those uh, comments and those questions. I think you raised some important issues which I'd like to dive into a little bit. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in this field. I think it might be helpful to me, but I do see some experts sitting uh, uh, um, in the audience. Um, do we have anyone from Peabody who could maybe address some of the budgetary concerns that the mayor has raised? 
And Mr. Mayor, if I could summarize, uh, of course, introduce yourself and whatnot. Uh, if I can summarize some of the questions uh, that I think I heard you uh, raise is, I think there is, um, you're, you asked uh, about the relative size of this cut uh, um, versus the overall size of this budget. So it seems like we got a big budget, but this is a small cut. And how do we think about that? Um, so it would be great if we can get some uh, views on that. Um, um, there was also some concerns about the impacts that uh, parking meter rates have on um, people leaving the city. Uh, uh, um, I'm not sure if we have information on that, but I, I do think that we have direct information on uh, the impact of parking meter rates on people's likelihood to park. And I think that relationship is kind of small, so I'd be surprised if there's this larger relationship, but I th I'll let staff unpack that a little bit. And um, I also heard some claims here that um, PBOT will not need to, PBOT is gonna have some choices about where we take cuts. Like, do they come in community programs? Do they come in maintenance programs? Do they come in operations? Uh, colleagues, frankly, it's my understanding that given the depths of cuts that we face at PBOT right now, we are likely, there is no way for me to not cut community programs, not cut uh, um, maintenance, not cut operations, and not cut real human beings like the ones who've shown up. Uh, so if we uh, can maybe get PBOT to come in here and uh, um, help me understand what's uh, going on. Uh, uh, do you need a sharper question or can you riff from there? <laughs> I think I can start with that and right. answer any follow-up questions. Uh, again, Jeremy Patton with PBOT. Um, maybe to start off with the first question just around kind of the size of the overall budget. Um, I think we all know the budgets can be sliced and diced in a number of different ways. So when we're talking about operating budget, that $200 million is operating budget, but it's all funding sources for the operating budget, not just the general transportation revenues. Um, so when we're looking at a reduction, we're just looking at the general transportation revenue reductions. Um, of that pot of money of GTR, it's about 150 million or so of expenses backed by those resources, but we can really touch about 92 million or so because there's money locked up in debt service and interagencies and overhead, et cetera. So when we, we start looking at reductions, we're looking at a, a reduction just for the parking meter rates of 8.3 million on a $92 million base. Um, maybe it's good to remind as well, we're already looking at kind of looking into next year, some pretty significant cuts on top of this, which total right in that $28 million range on top. So with the 8.3, we're looking at 36 million coming into 24 or 25, which is if you're looking at that smaller base, 35 to 40% reductions to, to PBOT programs supported by GTR. So there are a lot of like differences in, in the numbers, but I just want to clarify that GTR budget is a little bit different than the, the overall operating budget. Can, can I ask you a question on what you just said? Does that imply then that in the 24-25 budget, you have to come back and ask for yet another increase? What we plan on coming back with is a, with a large reduction options for okay. council to and, consider. I mean, so the, the underlying problem here really is it's, uh, we're limited in terms of sources of revenues. And, and by the way, I'm aware that this is not a unique situation for PBOT. I believe right. every transportation agency in the United States is looking at the same issues and potentially putting forward some longer term solutions. That's that's correct, yeah, we're looking at a, it's a structural deficit, I think but, what you talked but, about but earlier, it, but it's. Right, it, 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 it gets to my point. The real issue here isn't the lack of increases, the problem is on the cost side. We have a structural deficit and we have a lack of viable revenue sources. That's correct. So we're stuck with the parking. It may not necessarily be the, the best source of funding. In fact, I would argue it's not. Yeah, and what. Particularly at a time when, when traffic downtown is anemic compared to where it used to be. Yeah, we were looking at the parking. It's a, it's a short-term bridge to kind of maintain as many services as we can before we can find that alternative revenue source to, to help backfill the other reductions that we'll be facing. Maybe to clarify where we're at, um, <clears throat> let me ask you this question. Let's say we pass this 40 cent uh, increase in, um, and uh, parking meter fees. Um, given that, how many people at PBOT does the commissioner in charge need to uh, let go next fiscal year and then the fiscal year after that? 
without the 40 cents? With the 40 cents, even with the 40 cents. Just, I think the mayor is right. Uh, um, something which I think is important for everyone on this council and the people of Portland to know is that PBOT is on life support. Uh, um, no matter what happens right now, until we figure out a new fiscal model for this, this is a bureau which is in decline. And I think one of the lessons that I think I hope everyone here understands is um, if we do not begin to support PBOT, uh, um, we take a bureau that is a bureau and a vital services service that's on life support, and we are pulling the plug, and we are pulling the plug today. Uh, um, so um, I believe, well, I believe there's some cuts that are basically baked into our financial situation, no matter what. Uh, um, um, so let's say I. Let's say we get this 40 cent, let's say I win today. Uh, um, the mayor's proposal uh, uh, goes down, this council follows through on the commitment that we made to PBOT and we increase parking meter rates. Um, do I still have to lay people off or um, do we? does the bureau stabilize? We're still in that, that losing positions next year. So if you, if you take an example, what we talked about last Friday with 8.3 million, it was yeah. 50 to 100 FTEs. Yeah. So you would triple that just to account for the reduction. So if the 40 cents passed, you're still looking at 150 to 300 right. staff members. And it's, so 100, 100, 150, even if we kind of, uh, um, even if we uh, um, pass this thing. So, so what happens, how many people am I gonna lay, have to lay off over the next two years if we do not uh, increase parking revenues? That's another 50 to 100. Another 15, to, so what's the total there? You're in a range of 200 to, yeah, three, what is that? 400, somewhere in that Three. range. It's, it's hard to like just come up with yeah, the numbers while looking at the programs, uh, but. Just roughly what percentage of the people, uh, of staff over at PBOT would that represent? Is that a lot of our staff? That's 20 to 40 percent of the staff. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, budget director, you know, I'm a relatively new guy uh, uh, um, on the on this body. I know we've had ups and downs um, um, in the city over time. Uh, can you recall a time when we, when a bureau is laid off like, Three, four hundred people. Yeah. Three. Is, is, that, is that something that has happened off, in Portland before? I don't recall that, but we've had big layoffs, like with BDS and the when the economy failed. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but it was a significant percentage of their workforce. So there has been times in the past. Okay. So, uh, uh, but this would be amongst one of the biggest uh, um, that that we've seen. This represents uh, something extraordinary in Portland uh, civic history. Uh, is my impression of what's going on? Would that be a fair assessment? I can't tell you right now what levels of reductions have occurred in the past, but perhaps Christy knows from her recent experience. But BDS is the one that sticks to sure. my mind. BDS is the most um, sticking in my mind. I was just going to chat the BDS service manager to yeah. see if my recollection was correct. I really don't want to wing off a number, right. yeah. um, but I want to say it was over 25% of their workforce was laid off when um, BDS fund balances went to a very, very low level and um, there wasn't the general fund resource to support. Um, so there was layoffs as a result of that. <laughs> Do, I, I seem to recall that there were some significant um, uh, um, a significant deterioration in services over at uh, BDS once we made those cuts. In fact, I kind of feel like this current moment trying to get back on top of uh, permits is sort of a product of that. Um, to, uh, can you evaluate that statement? Is that your understanding of where we are, we are too, or? Can, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Sure, uh, um, big cutting BDS uh, um, by 25% hurt our ability to serve to get permits out the door with their operational and uh, service implications for this. In other words, if we cut a bureau by 25%, uh, should we expect uh, the quality of services that the people of Portland receive to uh, be undermined by that? Well, if we're talking about BDS, that was economically driven yeah. reductions because people stopped doing permits, they sure. stopped building, they stopped doing all kinds of things, which was nationally right, right. what was going on. And that led them to be taking a closer look at how they do forecasting, how they do funding, and they started building reserves. And PBOTs had reserves um, that they're using to offset some of these cuts as they do have contingencies. 
Um, and that's put PBOT in a much more stabilized situation. But even in their case, they could lose their reserves and have to convert to um, reductions in an economic situation, depending <laughs> how long the economy problem is. Sure. Can I, let me ask a question uh, to PBOT. I, I know, and thank goodness, we do have reserves. Uh, how, many, how much do we have in reserves left, and how much do we expect to have in reserves in two fiscal years? So we... We had about 63 million pre-COVID. Um, yeah. that, that balance is basically down to zero by the end of this fiscal year, just given kind of where we're at. Yeah. Um, we still have our reserve fund, which is supposed to be 10%, and so we're still kind of maintaining that because that has a lot to do with bond ratings, et cetera, yeah. and we haven't touched that. So there's another 9 million in that, but we typically hold that aside. But the balancing reserves we have for our forecast were 63, and those will be down to, to zero. Okay, so we're kind of out, we're out of reserves, and colleagues, I'll just point out that I think. Um, if we continue down this route, uh, we are talking about uh, layoffs in Peabot um, of more than 100 people, uh, maybe many hundreds of people in the next couple of years. Um, you know, I am not against belt tightening and reimagining how we do our work, uh, but if one of the expectations of um, the people of Portland is that they pay their taxes and get good services. Um, I can just guarantee you um, this is going to undermine our ability to provide the people of Portland with transportation services. And I can also guarantee you there is going to be a no area within the Bureau uh, which is um, not impacted by this. This will impact community programs. This will have impact maintenance. This will impact safety. This will impact bike lanes. This will impact Freight. Uh, um, this is too broad and too deep uh, to contain the um, to contain the um, this cancer. Uh, and I see my colleagues have their hands up, so I will put my hand down and allow the discussion to evolve. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Point of clarification, uh, Commissioner Mapp. Sometimes I heard twenty cents. Sometimes I heard forty cents. So Where were you in that dialogue? My my point there is. Um, I think the mayor uh, um, basically suggested, amongst other things, is that we got to cut the fat in city government. And I, I agree, we got to cut fat in city government. I will also point out to you that um, even under the best of circumstances over the past couple of years, PBOT has been one of, if not the only bureau in the city of Portland that has consistently taken cuts over the past three, four years. Um, so PBOT, if you want to shrink PBOT, good news. Uh, PBOT is um, on a glide path to be cut um, no matter what happens. Uh, what we are doing here today uh, um, is that, you know, and in our wisdom about mm, last fall, I believe, um, or maybe I think it was the fall of 2022, this council recognized the challenge that PBOT was facing. Uh, we decided to raise uh, parking meter revenues for the first time since 2019. 2016, I believe, uh, um, to help stabilize the Bureau. Now uh, we have proposed to uh, uh, um, actually forego that uh, rate increase, which you know arguably should probably happen every year, every two years. Um, so we are accelerating the deterioration of PBOT, and I would argue that um, I think it was Chris Smith who might have said, you know, PBOT is a, is a bureau that is, you know, on life support. We, we are a bureau on life support. And um, should, they, should we, if we do not um, embrace the financial plans that uh, we adopted as a council um, and that are contained in the mayor's proposed budget, uh, not only is the bureau on life support, we are pulling the plug today. Um, I have not seen something like this in an urban setting um, Ever certainly, I, I this is a truly remarkable moment. So, is that argument for your amendment, which is twenty cents or forty cents? Uh, my my argument for uh, my argument for the reason why I brought forward the twenty okay, twenty the twenty cent piece is to try to stem the harm that we are doing here. So, instead of laying off three hundred Peabot workers over the next two years, maybe we could only lay off 150 PBOT workers over the next couple of years. Um, you know, we're still doing the math over here. You know, I am going to do everything I can to keep community programs like 
um, safe routes to school and bike buses and uh, Sunday parkways going. Uh, frankly, given the plans and the proposals that we're about to vote on today, I really don't know if I can do that. Um, I know Commissioner Rubio cares deeply about meeting our climate goals, which means building uh, um, green infrastructure. I mean, I can tell you that all infrastructure, green or brown, is uh, I'm going to be deeply rolled back. Okay. Um, thank you for that clarification. Sure. I was looking at, um, I wish we had data. Is the data that we're dealing with today with these was projected pre-COVID, was that right? The, the meter suggestions that those were analysis was taken pre-COVID, correct? You know, which, which analysis are you speaking to? The analysis that I was reading, that I was digging into, it was um, parking rates that were pre-COVID. The like parking rates pre-COVID? We, we made budget, budgets based on a reality that we're not currently in. It was pre-COVID. Is that, that's correct, right? Sorry, maybe I'm not understanding um, your question. I don't get no. I might help. See. Maybe it would help. I we don't haven't know how done it's anything to manage parking rates since 2016. So one of the problems here is that this council, for whatever reasons, has taken about seven years off from trying to manage this issue. Okay, so the, the analysis is pre-COVID, that's fine. Um, I think here's what I wish I could get from PBOT, is what was the usage pre-COVID of our, the usage of meters, period, and then what has been the change since 2020 after COVID, the first hit of COVID in March, and then it changed, right, because that's when we saw a dramatic decline, not because of the rates, but because people weren't, it was really easy still to get parking places throughout Portland the last few years, correct? Yeah. Except by PALS on a Saturday. But for the most part, it's really pretty easy to get parking spots. And so it would be helpful to just see what that usage is, because that's obviously a big factor in how we could forecast going forward. That's what I would like to see. So I just wanted to make that point. And Commissioner, I yeah. really hear the pain, and I'd like to put the we word in there, I think we all care about Sunday Parkways, and I know that Parks Bureau could be really helpful to making certain that we don't drop that program. So I hope no matter what, we can look to how we can work together with cross bureaus to continue such programs as uh, Sunday Parkways. I appreciate your um, your um, spirit of collaboration, Commissioner Ryan, and I will certainly uh, reach out uh, to everyone on this council to see what we can do to preserve uh, the vital services that Portlanders love, like Sunday parkways, like uh, paved roads, uh, like safety improvements, uh, like clean water, like... Um, uh, uh, protecting our river from pollutants. Uh, these are all the things that are on the table this afternoon. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, let's see. I want to make some space for the rate decreases or the reduction in proposed increases. But before PBOT leaves, ha has there been analysis done in terms of predicting behavior of the original 40 cent increase? You know, the, how meaningful is that to? Uh, at, to people who park downtown, anticipate parking downtown. Um, I, I was privy to some summary of, of projected behaviors, but I, could you update us on we, what, we, what parkers tell us about that price increase and what they don't tell us? Yeah, we've done some polling on it um, recently, and some of that we, we talked about last Friday. I just pulled it up just so I would have the numbers in front of me. It, it said only about 4% of the surveyed um, people said parking um, influence their decision whether or not to drive downtown. 82% um, didn't know the exact price of parking, and once they know, knew the price of parking, 94% would still choose um, to park. But as far as the, yeah, any more analysis on top, that's just a polling number. And that's that a polling of the 40 cents, uh, or uh, just to be clear, I was that's passing just a polling notes, of so current. Can, yeah, it, it wasn't saying, and if we increased it, that's the polling of just the, the current parking rates, yeah. Got it, so, it, you know, the perception here is that, based on what you're summarizing there, that 40 cents isn't necessarily going to drive substantial behavior uh, in the choice to come downtown. Is that, I mean, or to, to park somewhere in the city? Not substantial. We always do build in our forecast as parking rates go up. We do build in a little bit of people, you know, less parking happening. Um, that's just something that we do from a financial point of view. 
Um, but I couldn't give you, I, I haven't done any in-depth analysis about like the percent of people that with a 40 cents would but say the yes poll, or no. the polling, and, and I'm sorry, could you just repeat one more time? What was the polling of that was, a, uh, was that, it wasn't related to the 40 cents, what was the, what was the specific question that was asked on the polling? And the specific question was, um, did parking influence, did the price of parking influence whether or not you came downtown? Did you know what the price of parking was? And then once they told him the price of parking saying, did that, in, would that have influenced you to come downtown or not? Got it, got it. Um, you know, and in in, we did some quick analysis, 40 cents per hour, two hour parking downtown, 80 cents, you know, often less than the price difference between a grande and a vente at Starbucks, right? And whether that's really gonna impact behaviors, I think we concluded maybe not. Uh, that was our back of the envelope calculations. The bigger concern is that we're, what does it say about our brand as a city where we're struggling mightily to get people to come downtown? And one more increase, you know, while marginally might not impact decisions, what does it say about the city? And I would just leave that as an observation that we don't have good data that the 40 cent increase is gonna reduce parking downtown or people visiting downtown, but it may hurt our perception uh, of our willingness to retain people um, and their behaviors. With respect to the rate increases, this is really for, for you all. So walk me through this. We, ha we, we, have, we had forecasted rate increases for BES and the Water Bureau, and that was baked into the budget. Mm -hmm. And so we learned of reduction in that. I think I learned of it 36 hours ago or so, uh, what the magnitude of this reduction. Um, what, what is the what is the aggregate impact on Water Bureau and BES of those reductions? Give me a moment. You got that. Yeah. Uh, the aggregate yeah. on each reduction yeah. for so for um, for PBOT that's 8.3 million. There is 2.4 for um, BES and then another eight. I mean 2.4 for Water and then another um, um, eight million dollars for BES. So those are the ongoing reductions. The SDC cuts are represented as a one-time reduction. However, um, there could be case for some of those to be feeding into an ongoing rate impact. So what is the ongoing aggregate impact of mayor's budget notes four through six? Just a second. And while you're doing the math, I'm gonna make an observation. All of these fall on infrastructure. And so when I take a step back and I look at our budgetary priorities as a city, we are, if these pass today, which I suspect they're gonna pass in some version, we are choosing to take the entire burden of these cuts on infrastructure. And I have deep concerns about that choice as a budget and such short notice. And I'm previewing where I'm ending up, but I wanna understand the aggregate impact. Well, um, I Tim, I just um, added that up. It is 18.7 million across those three funds. Okay. And I think it's, while much of it could be infrastructure, they should be looking at their operation costs as well. It should be a combination. And that's part of some of the, um, the way we posed the budget notes was to make sure that they come back and inform council longer term how they're going to offset those cuts. Got it. So it's you're saying that the likely be people, as right. opposed to assets with these with these decisions. Right. And but you are right that a large portion of both water and environmental services is about maintaining infrastructure and building new infrastructure that's regulatory required. And and you know and I'll just leave on the table. I am deeply concerned about the business climate and our ability to re attract and retain citizens and taxpayers for the city of Portland. I am also deeply concerned on any cuts that materially impact infrastructure and public safety. And uh, you know, these would not be my, but my budget priorities aren't reflected in the decisions that seem to be baked here, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, at the disproportionate impact on infrastructure here. So I, I, we're gonna take a break because I've had two requests for people to take a break. Th there's two things I wanna ask. First of all, your study says there's no real impact on parking meter increases. That's not what I've been hearing from PBOT. If that is true, why haven't you increased the parking meter rate since 2016? 
and ameliorated some of these budget crises that we're now wrestling with. Yeah, and what it, that's the polling that we did um, just recently of, of, of what those increases are that the public didn't know as far as kind of all of the reasonings why we haven't. I'm probably not the best person to answer that um, question just as far as why we haven't done it. Um, I know we, we held parking rates um, flat during the pandemic just because of the lack of, you know, people parking downtown and everything else that was going on. Um, I do want to maybe say one thing is that the 40 cents is really just that it's inflation trying to catch up to 2016. So that's what we're trying to do is we should have probably increased parking by a little bit every single year since 2016. And that, that's the process and, we've And I appreciate to that. I'm not yeah. putting this on you specifically. You know that. I like yeah. you and I, I trust you and I think you, you give excellent analysis and I thank you. For me, the part of the problem that we're experiencing here and part of the larger point I'm trying to make and what's changed for me, and I'll just speak for me, is that it's not any one of the literally hundreds of tax fee and utility rate increases that are currently underway just in the city of Portland. That doesn't include Metro, it doesn't include TriMet, it doesn't include Multnomah County, it doesn't include other jurisdictions. The problem is the cumulative impact. We now can measure what that impact is having on the people who live here, the people who work here, and the people who are making decisions about whether they want to invest here. And what they're telling us loudly and clearly is cumulatively, these increases are choking the life out of this community. People are picking up and they are leaving our community. And we have to turn that, and we have to turn it by encouraging people to see the work we're doing and believe in the work we're doing and believe the value they're getting for their very high tax fee and utility rate increases in this city are worth it to them. And while I understand that you know, we're, we're talking amongst friends about our fellow employees, about the programs that we hold dear, about the process and the, the work we do here, we have to remember that the public is struggling and they're waiting for us to show them that we understand and have empathy for what they are experiencing. And that's the root of my interest in doing this. And again, I just want to underscore, these are not cuts. These are fee increases that I'm proposing we not take for one year. And what I'm hearing is if we don't keep increasing our fees each and every year, even for one year, it will have a catastrophic effect on our ability to deliver services. And so I, I would just say collectively for all of us, we shouldn't be in this position. We shouldn't allow ourselves to get into this position. So whatever we vote on today, we have a lot of work cut out for ourselves. I will not turn this over to the next city council. And, and Mr. Mayor, yes. in, that, in that regards, if I could, um, you'll find in the budget notes that we believe in the budget office, and I think transportation agrees that they have to redo their strategic plan given their financial situation. Okay, but they're, you're still using and, and they'll the existing finance. Complete Excuse support. Me. No. The, the, Why don't we, colleagues, plan. take yeah. about a seven-ish minute break? Commissioner Maps has his hands up. No, we'll no, no, that's no, fine. First, oh, we'll sorry, was, All right, we'll take no. about a seven-minute break. We're in recess.
So we, we have, we've taken the public testimony, we've put amendments on the table and seconded them. So now we're in discussion and if we're done with, when we get to the end of the discussion, we'll vote on the amendments up or down. That's. So I'll wait till Commissioner Gonzalez is back and make sure he doesn't have further. Oh shoot, I have my phones upstairs. That's disappointing. Huh. Couldn't hurt. Hey, Bobby, can I talk to you for one Is that tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> or something. Oh, God. Well, I got I got to get mine loaded in a computer too. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, yeah, um, we, we, we may or may not have further questions for you. Um, so colleagues, I've, I've exhausted my questions and my comments on that particular subject. Are there other issues people would like to raise? What's the next step, in, or Mr. Mayor? What's so the, the next step, uh, so we, we have put amendments on the table and seconded them. We've heard public testimony. The next formal part of this process is to go through each of the, man, the amendments individually and vote in favor or opposition, then at the end, we'll, we'll uh, go to the main motion as amended. Thank you very much, we appreciate that. So, uh, Commissioner Maps, go ahead. Sure, um, it's getting late in the day and the stakes are high and we got lots of people in the room. Um, and it might just be helpful. And frankly, a lot of the things that I manage are, are on the table. Um, and it might just be um, efficient um, to, for me to be transparent and offer this council and the people of Portland uh, my best and most constructive thinking about how to move forward. Uh, first, I wanna say um, I appreciate what the mayor is, is trying to do here. Um, it is certainly the case that uh, um, Portlanders are frustrated with both the amount of taxes they pay and the services that they uh, receive in exchange for those taxes. Uh, completely fair, and I do indeed think that that is one of the things that is driving Portlanders to move across the river or um, to Lake Oswego or, or someplace else. Um, at the same time, you know, so I think it's completely reasonable for um, this council to look at lowering the rates uh, that we charge in taxes, um, and we should bring a critical eye uh, to doing that. At the same time, you know, one of our things that we're also trying to manage is the quality of services that we provide uh, um, to folks. So, for example, we've heard in the context of PBOT today, we can save uh, Portlanders um, maybe 80 cents per parking trip, uh, um, uh, which is probably not going to be the thing that keeps you st staying in Portland if you're thinking about moving out, uh, but it will have, uh, by foregoing that 80 cents over two hours increase in parking meter revenues, we will actually see uh, dramatic and profound and unavoidable uh, um, reductions in services to the people of Portland. So I think we need to balance this out. Uh, and today we have a range of essentially tax and fee cuts here. Um, some of the benefits are kind of small and widely diffused. Um, I would argue, for example, uh, the parking fees, um, the, the, the parking fees and the rate increases are very small uh, um, increases uh, our cost to individual Portlanders. Um, and frankly, by foregoing them, uh, the quality of service that 
folks are likely to receive here in town is going to decrease dramatically. So I actually think in that space uh, for the rate increases for parking and utilities, it actually doesn't balance out. We are not helping ourselves. And indeed, when you take a look at some of the specific compromises that you're likely to see water and BES in particular take, um, I would argue these are not necessarily cost savings. By the time we actually do our books over the course of like three years or whatnot, uh, we will, I think in some cases, actually wind up paying more. Um, so, colleagues, um, but that is not the case with um, every proposal that's on the table today. Um, and, and I, th this has all happened so fast, and it has been, uh, which is an issue in and of itself. Um, uh, so I think we're all trying to catch up with this process. Haven't had a chance to uh, um, have a dialogue with everyone on this council, uh, and things have changed so much. Uh, colleagues, here's my... Um, suggestion for how to move forward, and this represents my best thinking here, um, and I'm trying to be authentic and constructive. Um, I really do think that um, the, proposed in, the proposed rate increases for the utilities that are contained in the mayor's proposed budget are wise policy that we should follow through on. You know, the total uh, savings that you're likely to get sent to individual Portlanders um, by freezing uh, BES and water rates are about $2.25 a month. Um, on the other hand, um, that will cost those two bureaus about 12, no, $10.4 million. I will tell you some major capital improvement projects will be canceled, delayed, whatnot. And you're also gonna look at the bureaus um, foregoing some requested positions that are in the contained budget and actually probably having to lay off real flesh and blood human beings, all to save the average Portlander about $2.25. Um, you're not making money. You're not making money there. You're not really, uh, um, you're actually not improving our, our position in the real world. Um, and we've heard about some of the challenges with PBOT, uh, PBOT's rate increase. You know, we've heard a, an amazing array of community experts who question the process, uh, raise issues about what this will do to the Bureau. Um, I, I find that com compelling. It is also the case that if, it's, if it is our goal to um, prevent Portlanders from uh, moving out of town, um, it just doesn't smash pass the smell test to say uh, the reason why people are, Portlanders are, are leaving the city is because of parking meter rates. Indeed, we have surveys that show um, parking meter rates don't even impact where people park. Uh, um, this is just such a small uh, expense for most Portlanders. This is what is not fundamentally driving the dynamics that we're trying to manage here. On the other hand, uh, um, I do want to say um, Commissioner Rubio's proposals to freeze SDCs, um, here um, you can see the benefit, um, or at least the potential benefit. And let me explain uh, um, what's happening here. You know, if we were to freeze um, SDCs for my bureaus, I don't know the deal with parks, but uh, if we were to freeze SDCs for water and BES and PBOT, you know, you're probably looking at putting off about $60 million in capital projects, um, um, at the very least, and it gets even worse when you add in PBOT. On the other hand, you would dramatically bring down the um, cost of bringing, of building a new home in Portland or building something new in commercial. So for example, if we freeze um, SDCs uh, for water, BES, and PBOT, I think it would basically make it about $1,800 cheaper to build your average uh, residential unit here in Portland. And it would actually bring down the cost of uh, freezing SDCs would also bring down the cost of um, building a new commercial unit by about $24,000. And I will tell you that, you know, I don't know if that is actually going to stimulate uh, um, housing production or if it's going to stimulate commercial uh, um, construction. How, um, but I kind of get how that's an interesting experiment and an interesting play. Um, and if we are willing to um, put off, you know, 
60 plus million dollars in capital projects to see if this incentive works. That kind of makes sense to me. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll, I will actually vote for it and I appreciate Commissioner Rubio's um, vision and uh, kind of propose this. I will rec, I also want to say these, you know, freezing these SDCs also means real trade-offs. They're important projects that we need to build, which will not get built. Uh, you know, BES and water do not build uh, frivolous projects. You know, we, we're in the business of moving clean water one direction, moving dirty water the other direction. There's not a lot of excess there. Uh, um, so eventually, even in this context, I, we're gonna have to build these pipes. Um, but maybe we can kick it down the road, which means that they'll become more expensive, but maybe we can, uh, it might be worth, and I would argue to my colleagues who are eager to cut taxes today, as I am, um, freezing SDCs actually concentrates the benefits exactly where we want, which is to make it easier to build residential uh, doors and easier to build commercial doors. It will come at some costs, but this is a meaningful experiment. Um, I will also say, just to be frank, I think the freezing of the uh, uh, PBOT rate increase is one of the most mystifying um, uh, policy proposals I, I've seen this council bring forward in the past 10 years or so. Um, this really doesn't look like good policy to me. And I would say very much the same thing about utility, uh, um, the utility rates. We're talking about saving the average Portlander about $2.25 a month. Um, and from that, we are going to essentially just kick the can down the road uh, um, to build these pipes, which we just are going to have to build, uh, both because these pipes serve people and frankly, the federal government makes us build these pipes. Um, so if I were to propose a... Uh, here's where I'm going to vote today. And I, I hope that you find these arguments compelling, colleagues. Why don't we get to the vote? And, and then... On each of the votes, you can tell people why you're voting, if, if that's okay. I, sure. I'm just looking at the clock, and I'm looking at our exhausted public employees, and I'm mindful of the fact we've been in council I since 9 whatever my this colleagues morning. want. If you, is that okay? Sure. Good. All right. Why don't we do that? So, colleagues, I'll ask one last time, because I have to. Are there any additional amendments? Seeing that, Mr. Actually, Mr. Mayor, it's, I, I promise this is a light one. I've been informed that I need to clarify the title of my amendment. Uh, should I do this now, or should I let this play Legal out? Counsel, do you, what is it he, he needs to do? Um, he he just he had a verbal typographical error that we're just trying to to get correct for the record. He read the title of his amendment incorrectly. Uh, so just to uh, clarify for folks, I uh, Maps Amendment One's title is reduce on-street metered parking by twenty uh, cents per hour in the. Portland Bureau of Transportation FY 2023-24 Budget Transportation Operating Fund. I get that one right? All right, thank you so much. And that's, that's maps number one and we don't need to do anything else. We just take that as a Scribner's change. Perfect, all right, good. So now we will vote on each of the amendments. Certainly you're welcome to, to uh, share any thoughts you have. Are there additional, is there any additional discussion on the technical change to attachment B? Seeing and expecting none, Keelan, please call the roll on the technical change to attachment B. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The motion carries. Is there any additional discussion on Wheeler 1? This is update the policy on the five-year financial planning timelines and submissions. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll on Wheeler 1. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I vote aye, and the amendment is adopted. Is there any discussion on Wheeler 2? This is the development of policy and process for the timing of revenue bonds and utilities. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Is there any additional discussion on Wheeler Amendment 3? This is the budget note around inventory and review of bureau specific fees. Any further discussion on Wheeler 3? 
Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Is there any additional discussion on Wheeler 4? This is reducing the rate growth for the water bureau retail rates to the fiscal year 2022-23 forecast of 7.7% growth. Any further discussion on this item? Uh, yeah, um, colleagues, I'd just like to point out that this particular amendment would save the average Portlander 63 cents per month. It would cost the Bureau uh, about $2.4 million. Uh, the Bureau would also lose 11 requested positions, and we would either have to fire six people over at water, or we'd have to find another 11 million dollars uh, in capital improvements, uh, our capital improvement projects to kick down the road. Um, though that $2 million, that uh, 11 lost positions, and um, that $11 million in capital projects that are, are deferred um, is all in the name of saving uh, Portlanders an average of 63 cents a month. And if our purpose here today is to prevent Portlanders from uh, fleeing the city, um, I would argue uh, this 63 cents is not the camel that is breaking people's back. I think it has to do with crime and fentanyl and a bunch of other issues which we need to do better on too. Uh, but this will do real damage to an important uh, life-saving bureau and um, and it provides no benefits, especially if we take seriously what we're the claim that we are trying to prevent Portlanders from leaving the city. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. I'm just gonna offer some comprehensive comments if okay for notes four and six, so that Got I don't it. have to repeat them. Sure. Um, so uh, I appreciate the earnestness with which we're pursuing alleviating the burden on everyday Portlanders and businesses. Uh, deeply concerned about livability in the city and the relative benefit and cost of, uh, and how that has become uh, significantly undermined in recent years. Uh, in particular, we are facing the prospect of shrinking population and tax base and the prospect of businesses and residents looking for other places to live, grow, and build. Uh, however, these amendments, and specifically four through six uh, before us today, are late in the, late in the day um, and do not represent real fundamental reform or much needed shift in tax policy or fee uh, policy at the structural level. And to have that discussion, we have to have it with county and metro. We can't do it alone at the city level. We're talking the total burden on taxpayers. We've got to do it at all three levels simultaneously. Uh, that's what really matters to ordinary residents in the city of Portland. That's what matters to large employers. That's what might matters to high income that are flying the city's coop. Um, and so I welcome this conversation. I just wish we had created more time for a more thoughtful one, uh, not 36 hours to respond to material changes in utility rates. Um, I, you know, and I think, again, it's a tough time. We're trying to respond to the moment. Uh, and I think the best way to do that is with good governance, good process, consultation with our partners, uh, and at some point, you know, working to get concessions from them. If we're taking these austerity measures, and they're, they're not the deepest austerity measures, but they are meaningful, what assurances are we receiving from our uh, public partners? Um, we have recently approved substantial dollars that leave the city uh, every day. Uh, we continue to support the Joint Office on Homelessness, with, despite pretty substantial uh, questions about its effectiveness on the way it deploys dollars. And we aren't really revisiting those items today. Um, I think there, that is incongruent. Uh, finally, the, the disproportionate impact on infrastructure is a concern to me. Infrastructure. Uh, in the city has long been under-supported, under-invested in, and that's where we're placing the burdens today. Um, I think, I just would hope that in the future when we take on these significant issues of uh, tax burden, fee burden, we create more space for planning for the bureaus and for our employees. So uh, I am a no on number four, and uh, you, that's a preview to my other votes coming. Thank you. Fair enough. Any further discussion on Wheeler Amendment Number Four? <coughs> Seeing none, please call the roll on Wheeler Amendment Four. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. No. Maps. No. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. 
I just want to remind people, and I, I may sound like I'm a broken record, um, I somewhat object to calling these austerity measures. I served as the chair of Multnomah County for four years during the Great Recession, and I've been the mayor of this city for six and a half years, and I've actually seen real cuts to budgets where we actually reduce the amount of funding for budgets. And when that happens, it gets really ugly and very uncomfortable for everybody. These are not austerity measures. This is me asking us to hold the line on increases that we are passing on to households and asking them to make cuts. And so I, I just want to be really clear about the frame that we're using here. Um, second of all, I realize I agree with something Commissioner Gonzalez just said. We shouldn't have to do this alone. I agree 100%. But what I also believe is that if somebody doesn't take the lead, nobody's going to lead. And I, I think it's really important for us, since we have the data and we have the knowledge and we know what's happening at the street level in our community, we should take the bold action to lead. And I believe that would put pressure on others to follow and join us in this discussion. Because again, I don't think it's about one fee increase here or one fee increase there or a meter rate there. Uh, or a utility rate increase there. Uh, I think it's the cumulative impact. We're steamrolling families in our community, and they're making choices to live and play and work elsewhere. And we're not hearing this occasionally. I hear it all day long. It's a value proposition. Are people getting the bang for the buck that they're spending to live here in our community? And again, I believe the value here is great. I have taken some heat for being uh, what some people believe is overly optimistic in the future of this city. I stand by that optimism. I believe that we're doing really excellent work together that will show good results. Uh, but in the near term, I just want to be really clear about what this is versus what it is not. Uh, I vote aye, but the amendment does not pass. Next item, uh, Wheeler 5. What? Could you say that again? Oh, I'm sorry, it did pass. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I mean, if you want to change your mind, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take the first one. Wow, it has been a long day. Thanks for checking my homework, everybody. I appreciate that. Keelan, uh, please call, uh, is there any discussion on Wheeler 5? Yeah. Um, colleagues, I will point out to you that the intent of this amendment, uh, this will, um, this amendment will cost environmental services $8 million in 23-24, and it will save the average Portlander $1.66 a month. Uh, and in, um, in exchange for that, um, we will see significant cuts. Um, and actually, even here, I will tell you, as I've taken a look at the portfolio of cuts that BES is likely to take here, I literally don't think we're going to save any money. Uh, um, I think we're just pushing uh, projects that inevitably we are going to uh, need to deal with uh, down the road to a point where they become more expensive. Um, I think we'll have to neglect some infrastructure, which will frankly collapse on us and cost us 10 times more than uh, um, just doing the work today. Um, again, um, the dollar and 66 cents that the average Portlander will save here, um, I, is, I am deeply skeptical that this is the reason why Portlanders are uh, going to uh, leave the city. However, I do believe one of the reasons why Portlanders will be leaving the city in the uh, coming years is our crumbling infrastructure. Uh, um, you know, the, the value proposition for the taxes that Portlanders provides matters, and what we are consistently doing this afternoon is undermining the quality of services that this city council provides to the people of Portland. We are not advancing our position here. We are shooting ourselves and the people of Portland in the feet, which is one of the reasons why I will vote no this afternoon on this item. Are we voting now? Or is this yes. A uh, well, it, it's, we haven't called the roll, but we, we get your point. Is there any other discussion? Very good. Call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. No. Maps. No. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. Next item, please, is item six, Wheeler six. 
Uh, this is to reduce on-street metered parking by 40 cents per hour in the Portland Bureau of Transportation fiscal year 23-24 budget. Is there any further discussion on this item? Commissioner Maps? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I just want to, uh, hear, you've heard, already heard the speeches uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, I just want to remind people of the process here. We have two amendments or two um, amendments today, uh, which basically gesture towards the same thing. We have Wheeler 6, which would forgo a 40 cent increase in uh, parking meter revenues. Uh, my amendment would basically uh, allow a 20% or 20 cent increase in parking revenues. Uh, if I understand uh, the way this game is structured, if Wheeler's amendment wins here, um, my amendment becomes mute. Is that correct? Uh, I think I'm, I don't know if I'm looking at the budget office or the um, lawyers here. So if this one passes, does, do we even bother to vote on mine? I think it's parliamentary. We could still vote on yours as a formality or you could move to withdraw it. Okay. Um, I was just kind of clarifying the run of show. I'll uh, turn the floor back over to my uh, colleagues. Very good. Any further discussion on Wheeler 6? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan? No. Gonzalez? No. Maps? No. Rubio? No. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment fails. Next item, please, is Rubio 1. Is there any discussion on Rubio 1? This is to centralize coordination of forecasts for the fiscal year 24-25 budget development. Rubio 1 is SDC's? Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. Sorry. His notes aren't right. Hang on. I'm going to go back to my originals. Hang on. Hmm. Oh, yeah. You're right. I see. All right. So, Rubio 1, this is the 23 24 system development charges. SDC's will remain at the fiscal year 22 23 rates. Any further discussion on this item? Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, Actually, I want to compliment Commissioner Rubio on this one. Um, um, I, frankly, we haven't had enough time to really uh, unpack and do an analysis here, um, but I understand the policy experiment that we're doing. Uh, we are basically um, holding down some charges um, or some fees and really concentrating the benefits on um, an outcome that we really care about, uh, which is building residential housing and building new commercial. This makes a lot, this actually makes sense. Um, given the incentives here, I'm not necessarily convinced that this is gonna trigger an explosion in new uh, residential development, um, but it's a, it's a worthwhile ex experiment, uh, um, one which I would actually, um, I think is worth looking at. Uh, so I'm going to vote yes on this. I um, appreciate the focus and the um, relatively good design of this particular policy initiative. Uh, I think it's also one for us to look at, um, evaluate as a year from now to see um, if we actually see an increase or change in the number of uh, residential units or commercial units that are um, produced because of this. So. With that, I'll turn the floor back to my colleagues. Please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. And I know we've had a lot of conversations about this, so just will say it again. I'm just so glad we're focusing on the bigger picture that will really get us results, which is permit improvement. Aye on this amendment. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I strongly support this, and I appreciate Commissioner Rubio and her staff bringing this forward. And I particularly want to appreciate the introductory comments you made when you were introducing this about the call to action, the need to consolidate, the need to take advantage of the opportunity we have as we move from a fragmented commission form of government to a more consolidated city administrator form of government. And I agree 100% with your comment that this needs to be trued up and rationalized before we open for business on January 1st, 2025. And I think this is a fantastic step in the right direction. Happy to vote aye on the amendments adopted. Next up is Rubio 2, which is the centralized coordination of forecasts for the fiscal year 24-25 budget development. Any further discussion? 
Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. We'll move to Gonzalez number one. Gonzalez number one is the direction for call response and allocation review for medical response. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Gonzalez two is the overtime analysis and reporting structure for Portland Fire and Rescue. Is there any further discussion on this amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. And then Gonzalez three is the uh, realignment of 400,000 in one-time general fund discretionary resources allocated to the Community Safety Division in the Office of Management and Finance to the Portland Fire Bureau for onboarding and training new firefighters. Any further discussion on this? Um, I, I will signal that I think I might support this at some point. I'm not ready to support it today. There's questions I would have that I don't think I can answer in the time I've had to review this. I haven't had a chance to review it with my team uh, or others in the budget office. That does not mean this isn't a good thing to do. And I believe there could be an opportunity for us to revisit this later, but I don't feel comfortable voting yes for it today. And I just wanna be honest about that. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. No. The amendment is adopted. And then uh, Ryan number one. Ryan number one is the assessment of the city arts program and future agreements. Any further discussion on Ryan number one amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, colleagues, I am pleased to begin streamlining investments in arts and culture in our city. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I greatly appreciate Commissioner Ryan taking this on. I, I know that this has been something that a lot of us have been thinking about, but he's willing to step up and uh, lead this. And I just want you to know, I know it's a big lift and you'll have my support, my team's support in any way we can be helpful. I vote aye and the amendment's adopted. And then Ryan two is the outgoing city grants policy and process review. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment's adopted. And then we have the Ryan Rubio Joint Amendment. This is one-time funding for the Diversity and Civic Life Leadership Program, the DCL program. Is there any further discussion on this item? Saying none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I want to thank Commissioner Ryan uh, for his um, op openness to working on a solution and also thank the mayor and his staff who assisted our team in finding a f financial solution to this challenge. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. Now we'll go to MAPS 1. Uh, Wheeler, whatever it was, uh, failed. So MAPS 1 is still a viable option. This is the 20 cent uh, increase in the parking meter rates per hour. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. MAPS. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I've, I've spoken extensively on this subject. I think you all know where I stand. I vote no, but the amendment passes. Colleagues, now that we've voted on the individual amendments, I'm seeking a motion to approve these updates to the change memo and the relevant attachments. We'll now vote to approve the changes our individual floor, floor amendments have made to attachments B, C, and D of the change memo as associated with the budget. This has the effect of incorporating all of our changes so that the approved budget, which we vote on next, reflects those amendments. Any further questions on this item? It's technical. Keelan, please call the roll. Ryan. You need a motion. Oh, uh, thank you very much, legal counsel. I, I move Second. The, uh, the change memo and relevant attachments and Commissioner Gonzalez seconds it. Thank you. Please call the roll. Ryan. Point of order. So we're, we are voting on the big, the big enchilada right now, right? Uh, the mini enchilada. 
What? Um, That's a mini. These are the, this is to update the um, attachments. This is the technical moment. A, B, and C. This is a technical moment. That's why I second it. All right. Technical. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. <laughs> aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. <laughs> the, the motion carries. All right, colleagues will now vote to approve our individual floor. No, we already just did that, sorry. Uh, now I'm seeking a motion to approve. This is Big Aaron Gelada. I'm now seeking a motion to approve the budget as amended. Can I get a motion? Second. Our motion, I move. Commissioner Ryan moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Keelan, please call the roll. Ryan. <clears throat> I'm really proud of the City Council continues to focus on budget decisions based on our top priorities. It started, I know, back when I first began in 2020, in the, in the fall of 2020. It's economic development, it's homelessness, it's community safety, and it's livability. We all envision and are building toward a city with thriving local businesses, job opportunities, entrepreneurial spirit, with creativity, and investments in the arts. In recent days, there has been a focus on tax and fee increases. This is not a new concern. The city of Portland has received no less than five audits between 2020 and last month on this topic. Common themes, no central oversight, lack of accountability, lack of consistency, lack of communication, a few lacks here, lack of clarity, all of which contribute to a potential harm to the public. Even more troubling, there has been a lack of implementation of audit recommendations with the exception of the audit on permit fees. And the solutions came directly when I was working as the commissioner in charge of BDS. And thankfully, Commissioner Rubio is building on this much needed trust we are building among the previously siloed permitting bureaus. As such, the culture of the big team has been forming and streamlining is now possible. And taking a broader view away from just the city bureaus and collecting fees for services, we need to look at how the collective we are spending taxpayer dollars and how we can make smarter choices. My expectation and personal commitment is that elected leaders from all local jurisdictions will have the courage to reconvene and to edit on a broken pattern of recently passed tax and policy measures and fee collections. And I'll admit, I voted yes on some of these. The county's concerning pattern of under expenditures of committed funding for the homeless solutions. The tangible fallout of Measure 110, we all wanted treatment centers. That is why it passed. So we have a backwards rollout at this time, and this has caused a lot of buy remorse. The underspending of the county's pre-K for all tax, <coughs> perhaps some of those funds could be returned. And the city's own inability to get Portland Clean Energy funds out the door as fast as they are coming in. We must come together as local government state leaders and respond to the reality of our current humanitarian crisis that is bringing down our city and our state. The skyrocketing deaths by overdose over the past two years is enough to pause and reset. We must act and reverse the horrible equation of expenses going way up and services going down. Together we can modify expenses efficiently and land the services that our residents deserve. There's good news today. Our proposed budget allocates resources for immediate relief for the homelessness crisis, and we are united in our focus on long-term solutions. We are committed to funding affordable housing initiatives. We are also committed to establishing opportunities for individuals to transition out of homelessness and into stable living situations. We can do both, and we will. Recent data proves the Safe Us Village program is successfully transitioning people from the streets to stable housing. This is just one of the many on-ramps we have committed to create. We have heard recently by our city ec economist, if you want to make a real impact, improve permitting timelines. I began this work over two years ago, creating a, a permit improvement team with Commissioner Maps, and we began collaborating with the eight permitting bureaus, using data to shorten permit timelines and improve customer service. Commissioner Rubio is now leveraging and building on this work to advance our housing strategies and is calling on all of us to do more to close the gap for affordable housing developers, business owners, 
and homeowners doing projects that require permits in all ranges of complexity. I'm all in for big changes in this area and will continue to advocate for reforms to improve our economy and our housing supply. We are determined to enhance community safety through strategic investments. We proposed increased funding for community programs to improve neighborhood outreach and activation. We will prioritize crime prevention strategies, including community programs, enhanced neighborhood lighting, and investment in recruiting our police force. In this journey, we will actively engage with community leaders and advocates, valuing diverse perspectives and ensuring the equitable distribution of resources. I'd like to now shift my remarks to my assigned work area. I'm really thrilled to be the Commissioner of Culture and Livability. I'm incredibly proud of the service area leadership team. They have been open to change and are coordinating services, working together, and behaving with voter intent even before the official charter transition takes place. Our budget process clearly demonstrates their thoughtful collaboration and is demonstrated in the following ways. The City Arts Program budget will shape the future of arts and culture in the city. The City Arts Program has been working tirelessly to evaluate our city's arts-related services. Over the last five months, it has become crystal clear the city needs to establish a centralized and robust Office of Arts and Culture, an entity that will serve as a beacon of support, empowering local artists and talent to thrive and ensure our creative economy flourishes. Through the Office of Arts and Culture, we will streamline initiatives, enhance efficiency, and foster collaboration within the arts community, and the city will expand its commitment in providing direct services, resources, and opportunities for growth and development for our artists, our musicians, our filmmakers, our poets, the vast beloved arts community, a sector who gathers and restores the heart of any neighborhood in our great city where they gather and create. I cannot stress enough the immense value and impact of investing in the arts ecosystem. In addition to the incredible community service citywide, the Bureau of Parks and Recreation is championing my mantra that downtown is the heart of the city and neighborhoods are the soul. The healthy heart pumps lifeblood to the rest of the city. And let's face it, our city's heart needs a resuscitation. That is the focus of this year's parks budget. Our investments embody the service area and combine community, art, and economic development with an emphasis on downtown activations. In commitment to the heart and soul of the city, I'm proud to have championed investments in the following areas. The restoration of the Thompson Elk Fountain, Portland's new Family Theater Arts Center, the Judy, and the Portland Art Museum Rothko Pavilion project. I've also championed support for the Portland Parks Foundation, and this advocacy was shared with Commissioner Rubio. In the current and last fiscal years combined, the foundation has received 300,000 of operating funding support with another 50,000 for events and 30,000 for small grants. Another 30,000 is budgeted for fiscal year 23-24 for small grants, and the mayor's proposed budget has another 25,000 in operating funds for next fiscal year. We highly value the foundation's engagement and advocacy on behalf of Portland Parks and Recreation and look forward to continued collaboration as we revive and reactivate downtown parks and community, space, and community spaces as one winning team. The Office of Community and Civic Life is advancing strategic alignment in returning to its mission of being an objective convener and ensuring all Portlanders have access to city government. And while building the scaffolding for the four districts outlined in the voter approved charter reform, the voter approved charter will bring the creation of districts and we will need to align our office to support this shift. It pleases me to see the purposeful shift of the office to truly be the bridge between Portlanders and the city. I'm also pleased to see the recruitment of new staff to positions that have been remained open for over a year. It's a new day in the Office of Civic Life, and I have confidence in the direction and focus. I want to thank TJ McHugh from my office for serving as the acting director to help us dive in and support this new day. Our office also asks the uh, Office of Equity and Human Rights as part of the 90-day resolution. This assessment determined that despite the fact the Office of Equity was created 11 years ago, 
75% of the workforce has completed racial equity 101 training. There are equity managers in 13 bureaus. There is a budget equity toolkit all bureaus are required to use for budget planning. And there is a requirement for racial equity plans from bureaus. There is more work to be done by the city to reach its racial equity goals. This is an opportunity for the Office of Equity to work more closely and directly with the community to take further action for racial equity in Portland. We have dedicated resources for community solving, problem solving with the Office of Equity at the table. We look forward to building forward, keeping equity at the center in all of our decision making. In closing, I'm a bridge builder and I like living on the edge of the tension and having dialogue with passionate voices who are willing to compromise. I'm committed to collaboration and transparency as guiding principles. I understand the importance of working together with city bureaus, community organizations, those in the private sector as we work together to ensure this effective implementation of our proposed initiatives. I will continue to rely on data-driven approaches and I will measure the effectiveness of programs and will be unafraid to make necessary adjustments. I will continue to build for forward with a heart of service. Thank you, Mayor and colleagues. It's an honor to work with all of you. I didn't get everything I wanted in this budget, nor did anyone to the right of me. And on a whole, it's a solid step forward for my beloved hometown. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Maps. Um, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote no on this one, um, and my no vote is a red flag and a warning to Portlanders. Um, this budget contains some remarkably bad choices, especially around infrastructure um, bureaus. I'll tell you, um, even before the amendments that were passed today, um, our transportation system was on life support, and um, we've essentially pulled the plug on um, on, on that live support. This is a very sad day for the city of Portland and um, the people who sit in these chairs in the years to come will spend about a decade or so trying to dig out of this and I, I, I wish them well. Um, and for reasons that um, still kind of mystify me, this, this budget contains some um, terrible decisions around um, uh, um, funding infrastructure, both in the water and environmental services space, um, in order to um, literally save pennies, we are going to spend tens of millions of dollars in deferred maintenance costs and deferred projects. None of this gets cheaper. Um, none of these things that we've implemented here are going to convince a single Portlander to stay in town. However, the city that um, we all live in and will hand down to our children will be in much worse shape as a product of the budget that we passed today. So I am very sorry to hear that. I know um, lots of people in this room and lots of people on this panel up here work very hard uh, to try to come up with a spending plan that would uh, serve the city well. Um, but in my evaluation, we did not succeed. Um, and for these reasons and more, I vote on, or I vote no. Rubio. I want to appreciate those who testified today as well as the robust conversation of my colleagues. Um, I also am very appreciative of the mayor and his team and our city budget staff and the leadership um, that each of our offices has taken in order to do our best to support our city and our bureaus, even if we have different strategies about how to get there. Um, what is very clear, though, is that we all have a passion for Portland and we want Portland to thrive. And we're also in a moment that we require, that we're required to act with boldness. And this is what I intend to do when it comes to catalyzing housing production in order to, uh, to address the systemic issues of housing instability, um, economic disparity and homelessness. Um, and we all have our work cut out for us, um, but it's also on us to support um, the work of the city. Um, to also engender trust and demonstrate outcomes. And so I'm hopeful that we can move in that direction uh, through collaboration and transparency. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, like Commissioner Ryan, I, I didn't get everything I wanted, uh, but I got most of what I wanted. And so I'm, I'm satisfied. Um, to be clear, I would have drawn a harder line than the line we drew today. We still increased utility rates to the people who pay for water and sewer services in the city of Portland. We honored all 
of the bond servicing for every capital project in our utility bureaus that has already been approved, and even one major project, <coughs> series of projects actually, that have not yet been approved by council. So I'm satisfied that the increase that ultimately has been approved by this council around both water and sewer utility rates is more than sufficient to hold us over for the next year. With regard to PBOT, I think, you know, I, I lost that one and that's fine. This is democracy, that's the way democracies work, but at least we had a conversation that I think highlighted that we have a much more serious problem in our Transportation Bureau than we've discussed in public previously. If we can't get by without a significant increase in parking rates at a time when we're begging people to come to downtown Portland, and we also heard that just plugs the gap for one more year and then we get to have the conversation all over again next year, we have much ser more serious underlying structural challenges <laughs> to our Bureau of Transportation. And this is news to nobody in this room. We've been having this discussion for years, but the bottom line is we haven't moved to do anything about it. So I hope this conversation today, I actually, colleagues, it, it was a heated conversation, but it was a really good one. And, and I hope you'll at least agree with that, whether you were on the right side uh, of this or the wrong side of it as I was. Uh, it highlighted the importance of a process that must take place in the near term about how we are going to fund transportation projects, infrastructure, and personnel in the years ahead. We clearly don't have the right model. The model we have is not sustainable. It is broken if it is relying exclusively on parking meter fee increases going forward, as was proposed by the Bureau leadership today. Um, I just want to be clear, that's not a model I want to turn over to the next group of city commissioners. That is not a sustainable model, and we now know it. And so even though I lost uh, that particular effort, I feel like I gained something in terms of spotlighting an important issue that we as a council must address. Uh, I really, as I said earlier, uh, Commissioner Rubio, I applaud your leadership on, on the system development charge conversation. This is one where, where you've given it great leadership and focus, and I, I expect my team to uh, come around and support you in those efforts, because as you know, it's the beginning of a process, and I think every commissioner here at some level has been involved with permits and system development charges and everything else, and there's a lot of work to do there. So uh, I got most of what I wanted. I'm perfectly happy. Uh, I will vote aye, uh, and the budget has been uh, approved as amended. So colleagues, as the budget committee, we also have to approve tax levies. The city shall levy its full permanent rate of $4.4.5770 4 per 1,000 of assessed value and 31,000, excuse me, 31,883,178 dollars for the payment of voter approved general obligation bonds, principal and interest, and $210,018,597 for the obligations for fire and police disability and retirement fund, 0 .8000 per $1,000 of assessed value for the parks local option levy, and 0 .4026 per $1,000 of assessed value for the children's levy. Furthermore, the city shall levy the amounts listed in attachment E for urban renewal collections. I'm seeking a motion to approve the tax levies. So moved. Uh, Commissioner uh, Ryan moves and Commissioner Gonzalez, can I take that as a second? Sure. Very good. Keelan, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The motion passes. All right, so uh, Director Grew, you get the last word here in terms of next steps. Why don't you tell us where we're headed? Well, now that you've approved the budget, um, we will go into the process of getting to the adopted budget. Um, the approved budget will be sent to the Tax Supervising Conservation Commission for review. TSEC has 20 days to review the budget. TSEC will conduct a hearing on the city's approved budget on Tuesday, June 13th at 9.30 a.m. Final budget adoption is set for Wednesday, June 14th at 2 p.m. 
Public testimony can be received at next Wednesday's approved budget hearing. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, that, that should be Tuesday, June 13th. Huh? Good catch. What's the, okay. Um, budget hearing on June 13th, TFCC hearing, and I'm mixed up here now, June 14th budget adoption hearing. And that will get us to the final approved adopted budget. Very good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our incredible staff who's here today, to our employees and the representatives who showed up today, our commissioner staffs and colleagues to you. It was a long day, but it was a very productive one. Keelan, you look like you've got something in mind. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Then let me just, <laughs> let me beer, just also, <laughs> yeah, a cold beer for Keelan. Uh, just once again, thank our, our council clerk and our legal counsel uh, for all the great work you do, as well as our security. We are adjourned.